All right, well, it's uh, a different night. We're doing Saturday nights of the first Friday night, but uh, welcome to the Atheist and Christian Book Club. Uh, the Atheist and Christian Book Club is a monthly gathering of skeptics and believers respectfully, and please remember that part, respectfully <laughs> discussing important books from both perspectives. So what we do is we'll take a Christian book one month and then a, a, an atheist book the next month, and we will talk about them and and try to learn from them. My name is James Walker. I'm president of Watchman Fellowship, an evangelical Christian organization, apologetics ministry, focused mostly on interfaith evangelism. So uh, I'm a co-founder of the, of the book club and uh, kind of the Christian half of the equation. And uh, Bill Cluck is a former Christian, now atheist, who is the uh, other co-founder of the Atheist and Christian Book Club. I'm very excited. In fact, the reason we moved to this Saturday is so that we could interview Carl Sagan's daughter this week about her dad's book, Pale Blue Dot, which we're looking at. We, we didn't know until we actually did the interview. This happens to be the birthday of her father. It would oh. be his birthday wow. today. And so she thought we had moved it to this date because it corresponded to his birthday. I said, no, that was a God thing. No, I didn't really say that. <laughs> <laughs> Coincidental, fully, fully coincidental that this happened. <laughs> Uh, but uh, I, I'm excited about this, um, uh, about this particular book. It, it dovetailed real well with our previous book. We looked at, uh, at the, uh, the book, The Story of the Cosmos, by uh, Daniel Ray, who was one of the co-authors, and we had another co-author with us of that Christian book. And Pale Blue Dot happens to be kind of a, a non-theistic look at a lot of the same information. So it, 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 you, you notice that those that got to read it, it kind of like a lot of the same information, but from a totally different perspective. I thought that was very, very helpful. Mm -hmm. And I want to get back on this and, and especially get to this interview that Daniel did with, um, uh, with so uh, Sasha Sagan. Before I do a little bit of housekeeping stuff, I want to talk about next month's book. We'll be meeting uh, December 6th. And... Um, We'll be doing actually my book. Now, I've resisted this because I don't think I've written a book that goes well for the club, but uh, I kept getting more and more people say, when are we doing one of your books? So we'll be, we're going to be doing, for December 6th, uh, the book, the book I, I co-authored co called The Truth Behind the Secret. This is a book that ought to be a kumbaya moment because it's not a Christian book necessarily. It's not really an atheist book so much. It's really a book about a whole other worldview, which is pantheism, or in this case, a new age form of pantheism. And so uh, I think we're going to have a lot of agreement from both sides of the aisle on this particular take. Um, well, and speaking of that, you know, we have laws of cosmology, gravitational laws, and scientific laws, but we also have laws of attraction, correct? Well, that's what... Which are well, just... That's the, that's the, that's the uh, allegation that we're going to be Well, that are just <laughs> as real as these other laws. And if you guys give us money, you will be blessed. I mean, there's no doubt <laughs> about that. I mean, this is a law of like... I mean, I think you'll agree with that. That's well, how you're getting into prosperity, guys. Oh, in my old... That's prosperity <laughs> karma. Prosperity karma. Uh, the secret was something um, that um, it's not a Oprah was pushing real hard about 10 years ago. Um, it, it, it's still, uh, um, there's been several sequels to the book now. It was originally a video that became a book. It was so popular that our publisher, Harvest House, uh, asked if we would consider writing some kind of response to it. And basically it's about this thing called the law of attraction. I'm not gonna spoil it for you. I do have some free copies of the book left. If you didn't get one last month and you want one, let me know. Uh, I'm also making available free audio if you want to listen to the book instead of reading the book. Um, just come by during the break and pick up. We have several copies right here for you. And I'm going to go ahead and pass around our, our flyer and help us get the word out on that. And um, we'll be meeting on uh, the truth behind the secret. Uh, now, one of the things that you're going to like about it, which is actually going to tie into this book, that we're, well, actually the last two books. Thank you. One of the chapters, uh, Rhonda Byrne, the author of the, the Secret, tries to say the reason she knows the law of attraction is true is because quantum physics has already proven it. Absolutely. That what the scientists Very are saying down. now is that is that on a on a subatomic level, thoughts actually create things. Now, what I did for what I did, I wrote the chapter on that. Our response to that was we we interviewed both Christian uh, particle physicists and atheist particle physicists and ask them what is meant by this. And uh, 
and you, you'll be very interested in the response, uh, the, the, the spoiler alert. I don't think Rhonda Byrne understood what she was talking about, <laughs> but no. you can read, read the book and see. But this is, again, something I think we'll have a lot of in common for. So looking forward to next month, and that's going to be December, uh, December 6th when we look at the truth behind the secret. But on to this uh, book. We're talking about Pale Blue Dot, written by Carl Sagan. Um, we did find on YouTube where you could get pretty much the whole audio edition of the book and watch it. How many of you got to either read the book or or, 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 or watch it? Or listen to it, rather. Some, uh, of, it. some of it, okay. We didn't have any, any core chapters this time that we uh, told you about that would have been helpful, I think. I felt like the last chapter was really, really pertinent to, to what we, we were doing here. Um, and uh, another housekeeping thing, just to we try to kind of get some kind of general idea and get a room shot of this. Uh, how many of you, uh, we want to see, kind of take roll a little bit, how many of you would identify as atheist or agnostic? Raise your hand. Atheist or agnostic? Okay, that's, I think that's over half. Okay. How many would be Christian? Identify as Christian? Uh, Anybody raise their hand twice? I didn't. <laughs> Anybody don't know. Uh, yeah, uncertain. Agnostic. Or maybe we have an agnostic. Yeah. agnostic. So, um, yeah. So, anyway, uh, how many of you um, got to, uh, you learned something about either uh, Carl Sagan or, or about the whole topic that you didn't know in, in reading? Remember, this book was written in the 90s, wasn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so it's, it's amazing, you know, science has come that much further in the decades since there, but there was still a lot of great information in there. One of the things that that book reminded me of, I grew up with Carl Sagan, but you forget after these years of how inspiring he can be. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's like on the one hand, I'm thinking, you know, you, you can't, I, I couldn't <coughs> help but read the book of thinking that every penny that's ever been spent on NASA has been well invested and we need to double down and, mm -hmm. and come back and why yeah. aren't we you know, why aren't we trying a man a man mission to Mars or something, you know, it's just like the, the he basically in, makes you enthusiastic for knowledge. But the other part of the book, the subtitle, what's the subtitle of the book? Um, a vision. A vision, vision of, human of human future in space. <laughs> I found it, tell, tell me what you guys think, I, I found it on the one hand to be, um, yeah, yeah, we need to, I mean, he, the survival of humanity is, is in part on trying to figure out how to get off this planet. Well, can I ask Dan, didn't you think that was the most fantastic book on cosmology? The, this book? <laughs> <laughs> he, he's a, he, well, as you'll see, I mean, his daughter is a gifted communicator as well, but that was not only was he a planetary scientist, but he was a gifted communicator as well. I mean, I got into astronomy when I was a kid. I'm interested in the universe when I was a kid because Cosmos came out when I was 12, and so it was, it was really surreal to talk to her because her father got me this but I think it's, it's one of the most eloquent books scientific books uh, science books and philosophy and everything else it is an eloquent it's a classic I mean if you're gonna if you're gonna talk about cosmology and, and astronomy and the state of the universe in the 20th century uh, this is the state of where we're at at the end of the 20th century and it's eloquent and you don't think and I mean because he doesn't even give any credence to the you know the notion that maybe God was behind this this deal. Well, one of the Did things, you get that, that he might have a little bit of atheist bias? Well, I, one of the things I asked Sasha when I talked to her, I said, yeah. reading her book that just came out and reading this again, there's a lot of uh, Judaism, Judaic influence mm -hmm. in, what, in what he writes. There's a lot of, a lot of his writing makes a lot more sense, his, his meditation on, on the pale blue dot, um, he mentions Psalms, and he's very, he's very familiar with scripture. And a lot of his proclamations, a lot of his observations are very Old Testament prophet, uh, Judaic. Um, you know, remember to be humble, remember to be kind, you know, uh, here are these laws. And so he's, he's kind of got that prophetic voice without Yahweh. Right. And that's, it was, it's exactly how she described herself as sort of secular and Jewish, still sort of steep in the monotheistic traditions of her ancestors but still grappling with meaning and tradition apart from Yahweh and finding meaning and purpose but, but in But in your book, The Story of the Cosmos, you're dealing with a lot of the same information, the, the vast size of the universe and, and, and black holes and the implications and all. And yeah, where, where you're putting it out is, is you know, evidence perhaps uh, that, that, that declares the glory of God, you know, from Psalms. 
He's looking at the same information and coming to a whole different... Uh, yeah, he looks at the Hubble Deep that. Field, and you're just like, oh my gosh, I can see the glory of God all over the place. Yeah. He's just like, ah, oh, it's just mass, you know, it's just, you know, <laughs> well, it, hydrogen. And I, as I, we chatted with Sasha, one of the, <laughs> one of the, one of the questions that we, 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 we touched on was why doesn't the universe count as evidence for, for God's existence? Because, you know, both her, her and her father very eloquently expressed the wonders of the universe. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, but they stopped short of attributing that to, to God's handiwork. Right. And, you know, she, she said so civilly to me, she's like, well, that's where we part ways, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and that's kind of where, you know, we left it. But it, it was, it's true, you know, we have this remarkable universe that, that a lot of her book, in fact, talks about uh, the celebration of the seasons and the cyclical nature of the heavens and, and, and centering celebrations on solstices and the equinoxes. And so there's this regularity of celebration that comes from nature, but yet she'll stop short like her dad did and, and, and attribute this, this regularity and unity in nature to, to God. But, but her celebratory ritual seeking meaning and purpose are derived from uh, the cosmos in a lot of ways, the, the summer and winter solstices, the stars, and, and those kinds of things. So she still finds meaning and purpose in the celebrations of, of nature, but without Yahweh, without God. Yeah. So is he suppressing the truth? Was he suppressing the truth as James gives a talk on that? I mean, why can't it's he not see me, it? It's Romans 1. Oh, <laughs> excuse me. It's the Apostle Paul. Oh, sorry. Well, one thing, one thing I learned in talking to her and reading her book was uh, she grew up her, her mother and father, Andrewian, who's a producer of a Cosmos, the new series coming out, uh, they were very open and very deliberate about teaching Sasha Judaism and Christianity, which oh, wow. I didn't know. They had a nanny. She had a nanny growing up for the first eight years of her life um, that they took her, to, took her to church. She was very open with the family about her Christian faith. She was a, uh, a nun that I think it was the Andes Mountains. Uh, she came to New York and worked for the Sagans, but she was very open about her faith in the Sagan household. And uh, Sasha grew up with an appreciation for Judaism and Christianity that was deliberately taught by her parents. So it wasn't like there was this forbidden, don't talk about religion or Christianity. They were very much open to, to teaching about it. So she's knowledgeable about so, the tradition. So when you got, got, said this, another really cool thing about the timing of the book and all that, and, and there was a lot of question that we had about, do we really want to do Pale Duke Blue Dot, a book that was done in the 90s and, and you know, going back and forth. This, but the, the, the more, well, I don't know how many of you saw on our Facebook page, just this month's issue of National Geographic magazine has the update on what happened with Voyager. Yep. It's all about mm -hmm. Voyager. Remember the whole pale blue dot photo is when they turn Voyager around and get that one last shot of mm -hmm. Earth, and that that's the pale blue dot. Yeah. yeah and well, Voyager has finally, which he predicted. I think he was off. By yeah. A year. Voyager Voyager one left our solar system in 2012, and he said in this book 2010. Yes, and, and so then, Voyager two was what. But was Voyager the one, the, um, the the instruments to measure what was happening as it goes through that. Uh, what do they call Helium that? Uh, yes, that it was not working. Voyager two, it was still working. So just this month, they're, they're, they 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 it did it a year ago, but it's taking that time to get the data and process it. Now we know it's much more mysterious than we thought it was, mm -hmm. and okay. so and, and this is the Voyager that he's talking about. You know, was it 40 years ago, however long? 77, 80, yeah. 80, 70, 80. And so it, it's taken all this time and it's still in the news right this this week as we talk mm -hmm. about it now. So it's just amazing to me. And he was pretty dead accurate about, uh, he was talking about Mars rovers. And mm -hmm. boy, he was on with Curiosity. I mean, he, there were some pictures in there and his descriptions were spot on to what Curiosity actually became. So there is some kind of a measurable boundary to our solar system. Mm -hmm. where, the, where the solar wind basically stops and encounters the, the extra solar the extra solar system energy particles wind whatever's out there they kind of a coming together whatever's going on there and it's it's kind of an unknown zone right now just like the Santa Ana's meeting the sea breeze in California kind of pretty much the same thing but I, I yeah. read the article and outside of the heliopause Voyager 2 is Gone. beyond it now yeah, yeah. And now it's picking. We thought it was basically going to be dead and lifeless out there. Yeah, and it's, it's picking up stuff. It's picking up a, just a soup of electricity and all all manner of particles. And you know, it's a lot more dense with stuff out there yeah. outside of the solar system. And we got to remember, the solar system is not just hanging in space. Mm -hmm. It's traveling. It's motoring along, right? Yes, so it's yes. leaving behind this tail of heliopause. The heliopause shaped like a teardrop. Mm -hmm. Really? Yeah. 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 And I just I just talked to for my podcast. I just talked to Dr. Guillermo Gonzalez who's a planetary scientist who wrote Privileged Planet. We just talked a couple of weeks ago. 
-hmm. There is evidence right now that's seriously being considered uh, of a ninth planet far beyond Pluto because of some gravitational equilibrium and the ways they found the, 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 a lot. Some of the, it's kind of weird. It's still kind of speculative, but there's yeah. basically, as Jim was saying, there's a lot more beyond our boundary right now yeah. that's just eye-opening and mind-boggling. We don't even have a clue as to really what's what's going on out there at that distance, but. Well, I do want to apologize. I think there was this little bit of misunderstanding that we weren't going to be able to actually have Sasha with us right now live uh, on, by video. We had to interview her earlier this week. That was the only time she was available. She's released her own book, a Small Creature for Small Creatures Such as We, and uh, she's on a book tour right now for that. So um, some of you got some questions in by video, and we've got some new technology that allows us to do a much better job of how we do a remote <coughs> video interview. You'll, you'll be able to see in just a minute. And in fact, maybe we ought to do that now. You wanna, um, this is a, a, an interview. Uh, we ask for questions. Remember, if you have a question about Pale Blue Dot, uh, Sasha Sagan, she was kind enough to join us and take our questions. <laughs> now, the first one we're gonna deal with is, um, uh, uh, Daniel Ray is going to ask the only provoc real provocative <laughs> this question. Is the, this, is the, this is the one that got her face kind of. Uh, she's like, she well, was, wait a minute. <laughs> extremely gracious. She and, was. Um, she was the whole and, time. And uh, uh, kind, gracious, and interesting to talk to. So, but um, do know that this question appeared about. 30, 40 minutes into our interview. So uh, we had some rapport going before right. I asked this. I didn't drop the bomb right <laughs> in the beginning, so. You ready? <laughs> okay, let's, let's watch this interview. Book Club. I think it's so great, and I think that you do this, and I think that um, the whole country and the whole world would be a lot better off if there were a lot more um, theistic and atheistic book clubs and groups and social gatherings, and we were a little less siloed and a little more interested in discussion and friendly debate yes. and uh, intellectual, intellectual uh, conversation. We do sit down face Has to face with people. Have any two people fallen in love from opposite sides? Uh, I'll have to ask James about that. I don't know exactly. <laughs> not, that, not that he knows. Uh, right, but, not that he uh, knows, right. Maybe, who knows. Because that there's not... Well, how would... Why would it? I mean, that's... It, I mean... It's to say, well, the universe has to be created by something or someone. Well, mm. but then did God have to be created by someone or something? Yeah, that's the, that's the, sometimes that's the question that gets asked a lot. But in a, in a Judaic Christian sense, of course, you guys know that God generally is not viewed as being created himself, but I know that. Right, that, but so why, why can't that be, why couldn't that, I'm not saying that that's my view, but why couldn't that be yeah. true to the universe? Well, I think in, in, for me, scientifically, you have the option between sort of the universe or the cosmos existing forever, being eternal or infinite. So okay. you have these terms, and this is what I think, you know, you talk about in your book, the idea of using the, the theistic terms, because I think infinite and eternal in terms of matter, um, knowing that matter and energy is infinite and, etern and eternal is something that you kind of have to assume like God is eternal. So one way or the other, we assume either. But, you, but, but you have to assume God is eternal. Yes, I mean, I mean that's there's. Where you're, that's I guess where I, we part ways. Yeah, that 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 the question that boils down to: Do I have, I, for lack of just being colloquial, for lack of a better term, just yeah. is the universe? Do I believe by faith that God is eternal and created the universe, or do I believe? You know, by faith that the universe has always been or is eternal because nobody was no, around. No, 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 no. There's a third way, which is just there is. We don't, we don't know. We don't have enough information, okay. but we don't have. I'm not saying that the no, universe it, is eternal. I'm just saying as we get closer to understanding that how this started, we may have more information, but that we have to sit with the ambiguity because to me, saying, well, I know by faith that God is you know, eternal, that doesn't fit in to me trying to understand scientifically how we got here and what how this all started. Yeah, 
Right. No, and I'm not advocating that we say God is eternal and stop doing science. I wouldn't. That's some people okay, might say. So but science no, it requires that we just keep looking for the evidence, and when we don't have enough, we just sit with the ambiguity until we have more. So, can I make a comment here? Uh, one thing you guys are all familiar with the Big Bang, that it, the universe started with a singularity and it expanded. You had inflation in the 10 to the just a brief second, it just had this terrible expansion and it's still expanding. And we did find the background radiation and so forth. But here's the problem is Christians latched onto this and said, oh my gosh, that proves God because it had to be have a beginning and thus a cause. Well, if you look at debunking Christianity, which John Loftus was here, and he has that site, he talks about Rob, Roger Penrose, who's a, not an internet hack, he's a real Oxford cosmologist, that <coughs> says we can have sequential Big Bangs and have a cyclical universe, so we really don't have to have a beginning. And it's called geometric conformity. So it's a real high-level physics, but it just shows you that don't listen to people like William Lane Craig. And if you look at the interview, you've got to scroll down, but you'll see that he goes, Roger Pinder goes, no, he got that wrong. He got, he got just about everything he could wrong. He finally got something right at the end. But don't listen to your minister. Don't listen. <laughs> listen to people that know what they're talking about. Wouldn't you agree? Damn. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm wondering if I should listen to you. <laughs> no, I, I, Roger Penrose, if anybody's interested, there's a very down-to-earth conversation between Roger Penrose and William Lane Craig on Justin Briley's Unbelievable uh, I actually wrote an art, a follow-up blog for Justin on that. Uh, it's a very digestible conversation. But the, the theory that Bill is talking about that Roger is espousing uh, is very eccentric. Uh, and Roger can do that because he's Sir Roger Penrose and he's worked with Stephen Hawking and he's allowed to play with the physics and, and come up with solutions. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're kind of quirky and even Roger says himself it's not mainstream cosmology. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. We're not saying that because it's a little strange that it, it must be wrong. Um, but, but in responding to Bill Craig's pushback about uh, an origin and what might be behind the origin of the universe, uh, Mr. Penrose was con continuously referring to metaphysics, uh, speculative theories, uh, and, and even, even appealing to, to mathematics, which even Penrose himself said has sor a sort of uh, uh, a realistic uh, objective reality, uh, kind of like a platonic realm. He, he, he is one of the few physicists out there that will say mathematics exists independently of mind. And Bill Craig was pushing back and saying, well, doesn't it make sense that, that all of this comes from mind? And, and uh, Penrose, was, he, he would come up with a story or some sort of metaphysical explanation to kind of go around the idea that the universe and mathematics came from a mind. So um, to say that there's no evidence for this? Of Unlike course, the big this band. is kind of no science. Well, it's not like not the science has not played yeah, the, out the, on the it. Point is, the, the good point is, is when you have a theory, mm -hmm. I just talked to Luke Barnes, when you have a theory, uh, the cosmologist, the ideal world is the theoretical cosmologists and theoretical physicists do the math and all this stuff, and the observational astronomists over here, they're, they're doing their thing, and they look through a telescope, and hey, that matches the math over here. And, Bang, that's what happened with the, the, the universal expansion in Big Bang cosmology. You had observational and theoretical science coming together, and that's what makes that model such a, a, a sticking point. But don't you yeah. think, Dan, you don't want to be too quick to jump on these... Oh, no, no, no. No, in the, in the beginning, when in the 20s and 30s, when this came out, even, even you know, the smart people were like, hey, let's not theologically latch on to this because this is a very new development. And in truth, Luke, Luke just told me, uh, I just talked to him this week, that, 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 that the reality of it was when the physics showed or was hinting at a beginning, it was abhorrent to the physicists in the discipline. Not be, not, it, it, just, it just was the static eternal universe was the way it was. Don't topple that. Uh, never mind the theological implications. It was just a very disturbing paradigm shift in cosmology. It, it, it's still disturbing. And, and I think that's why you're, you're looking for a while it, it and the thing with the with the Big Bang cosmology is you do have the background radiation that supports the theory and then they have that they will find the red shift that's the Hubble effect that backs the theory so you have the observational is bringing forth evidence that matches the theory uh, the, the problem is that you um, you don't want to you know you don't want to say that that means it's true all the models that we have are have a life sh a shelf life on them <laughs> Every model that we have has a shelf life, whether it's steady state model or big bang model, it all has a shelf life. Yeah, but life. we finally arrived at the truth with Roger Pembroke. So well, I mean, <laughs> <it's> not, <laughs> Pembroke is not just saying that William Lane Craig is wrong, he's saying all the cosmologists are wrong. He's, a, he's alone. He's alone. He's alone in this camp. 
Yeah. But you understood what you're saying, that the mass well, of the protons eventually dissipate. No, the the, there's no mass in the protons. Any electrons. The, yeah. the, the, what he's suggesting, his whole theory kind of hinges on the fact that the, an electron would eventually lose its mass. Right. And then without mass, you, you have a, you have a you space-time time. Time dilation, mm -hmm. that there's no space or time. and So it's very theoretical. No one's ever observed an electron losing its mass. Um, uh, and not it, Bill, Bill Craig misunderstood that per perspective of the theory and, and admitted he was wrong about that. Thank you. But uh, but it, it, but but if you watch that video, I mean, Doctor Mr. Penrose, when he's asked about when Bill's asking him questions about God and mind, he's just kind of like, well, I don't know. <laughs> hey, Bob's been trying um, to ask a question. Bob, you know, I'm <clears throat> I'm not trying to put an argument towards uh, religion, and I'm not trying to put an argument towards atheism, uh, and I'm hoping I don't lose my thought while I go through this. <laughs> but you know, this is such a big, big thing. Um, it's huge. Yeah. Uh, like Carl Sagan used to say, billions and billions. I love that. Um, but but you know, the concept was that that if something we we would lay on the ground and look at the sky. And, and we, we would try and grasp the fact that if something went away from Earth in a straight line, it would never, ever stop. It would never, ever stop. So that gave the concept of no beginning and no end. And that's what Roger Penrose says, that it can right. begin and end. <coughs> so, so why can't you just have so, faith, Dan? So here's the thought. <laughs> here's the thought that I'm working at is whenever we talk about Big Bang and, and you know, um, was it God that created this, or, or if, if God created it, who created God? I look from another standpoint. I mean, I'm not, I, I think it's really egotistical to think that, that everything that is here for billions of miles is to support this crazy Oh, absolutely, Bob. That's his whole point. Right, yeah. so, but, but yeah. this is my point. So the thing is that uh, to me, to me, um, and I happen to believe in God, but if there is that continuum that there is no beginning and no end, the reality is when I think about it, when this universe was created, it wasn't the start of everything, it was an addendum Right, right to what's already been there but they have to go and shoehorn god into the picture right I yeah, because of their that. bias right <laughs> but, but but see you know it could be a scientific thing hence no god or it could be um a god deal without having to even touch on who created <coughs> god because this has been here for eons and right. so what do you think never about beginning and never ending right. well my two cents and i i understand completely what you're saying bill um bob bob, bob sorry Close. um yeah. everything but your name i'm sorry i got it um <laughs> but I, I think first of all to dispel the idea that the universe is primarily see a lot of people get the fine tuning we talk about fine tuning they say well it permits life and we think that the fine tuning uh, the, the sort of straw man argument of that but this fine tuning argument says that the universe was created for us and that's not what the fine tuning argument says the fine tuning argument just says the universe the way it's structured permits carbon-based life to exist uh, it doesn't say how much it doesn't say where or where it is or whatever it just says that carbon-based life can exist it doesn't say that it that the universe's purpose is solely for our existence according to scripture the, the purpose of the universe is to declare the glory of God. It's for the glory of God. It's through Christ. In Colossians, it says this: that uh, by Him and for Him and through Him, all things have been created. So, but in, in answer to the, the the question of what maybe started it or what got it all here, you think of the dinner that we just ate. Uh, you could explain that through convection and and you know the technical ways of how you cook things, uh, and that's a perfectly legitimate explanation. You can also explain it in terms of the people that prepared it. So there are two parallel. Uh, legitimate explanations. You have a personal and a, and a scientific or a technical one that I think they're not mutually exclusive. They run in parallel like railroad tracks that you can have, you know, person as an explanation. Yeah, Bob made the chicken. And then you can have a technical explanation. Yeah, the oven, we set it at 350 and we put the oil and we cut the potatoes. And, you know, you can, you can have that technical explanation as well. So I think for me, you have those two sort of lines of thought running parallel, and they're not mutually exclu exclusive. And in that case, both explanations are true. Yes, yes. Why absolutely. is the water boiling? Well, you can go into the thermodynamics of water boiling and the heat, or you can also say, because I wanted to make a cup of tea. Yeah, and, and what I was talking about with Sasha there, there, and she said it at the end, where you notice that she went with you know the scientific explanation as though if we had a scientific explanation, we wouldn't need you know, uh, you know, Ron's boiling the water. 
you know, Ron boiling the water might not be satisfying <laughs> in a technical sense. Well, what do you mean Ron boiled the water? You want the technical details of Ron's boiling the water. If I just said Ron's boiling the water, it doesn't give you the technical details. You're not going to pass a, a physics class if you just say, well, what, why is the water boiling? Well, Ron did it. You know, that's not going to look good on a test. You know? uh, but, but, but I think Sasha and I were talking about two different things in the one sense where, where for her, the scientific, the technical explanation of water boiling at a certain temperature says that we don't need to, we don't need to mention wrong. Um, but you see the fine tuning in all of these amazing, which you know, we'll admit, you know, it, uh, constants and these precise things that have to be measured on a razor's edge for life to exist. You see those as pointing toward God and pointing toward, you, you know, for you and anthro and he, she's looking at it entirely different. What, what, what were you going to say? Nothing, just absolutely that. I mean, uh, I don't see why. Why do you have he to go and here, throw God into oh, the yeah. mix? Religions arose in part as attempts to uh, control, if not at least to understand, the disorderly aspect of the nature. And it's kind of like, I mean, this is just a very simple, simple mm -hmm. ex explanation, but it's almost like. And I, we've seen this in the book from the girl who had the hots for the tennis. I don't even remember. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Oh, she didn't remember fencing. But close, go ahead. Okay. But but it's all, that, that's how yeah. I remember. But, um, but, it, but it's almost like the more science we learn, you know, back mm -hmm. in, you know, 1800s, we didn't have a lot of science, so we just had a lot of faith because, you know, Papa's preaching and you got to listen. The more science, we get the more religion wants to get in on that yeah oh it's their horses it, we're not going to go by faith anymore papa said we were going by faith but now we've got to fight these people because they're using science oh we're going to put our little that's exactly what's it now it's evidentialist there. apologetics and then you yes. still that old school presuppositional apologetics mm -hmm. to say just believe and shut up and you know let us take care of it. yeah, yeah. i see that and completely that, if i may i see that completely <laughs> I can see that's a complete reversal of the way I look at it. I look at it, why am I here? Where did the universe come from? What are the answers to the big questions? Mm -hmm. Okay, what's all the evidence from every category? Science, AP, and everything. And what is the totality of evidence? And look at it. Now, we're all looking at all that evidence and coming to different conclusions. To, to accuse uh, Christians of trying to shoehorn God into the Big Bang or to fine tuning, I think, is unfair. Wait, not Ken, are, just, they, not are they just doing that? Christians. <laughs> you raise your well, hand. Well, Jim, Jim's had his hand up longer. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry. Go, go to Ken, hopefully. According to Christianity, God is eternal. He's infinite in the past and the future. The arrow extends both ways, correct? He's or always if been. If he's in time at all. Yeah, then, right. Yeah, right. That's, um, yeah, he's facing outside the earth. By its very definition, if if the past is infinite, by its very definition, there would been the creation could never have happened logically. Yeah, in a, in a linear right. time scale, you, you totally can't, yeah, agree. If, if we would, we would exactly say that right. God you'd never out. get to you never right. get to creation. Right. Yeah, we the incremental that, steps yes. would always prevent you. From, it's like going to a library. The, what would book. prevent you? The the incremental steps, like going to a library where there's infinite numbers of books. Or the arrow yeah. that How makes it halfway you have, to the target. You're the new library. And it never gets to the target. You just yeah. got hired. Your <laughs> job is to put numbers on all the spines of the infinite library. Right. Yeah. Where do you start yeah. with one? Yeah. 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 You're right. And this has been one of the philosophical arguments why, theoretically, time could not be infinite just because we could never arrive where we are. Forget yeah. God. Just time. Yeah. I've never asked that question of a, of a believer before. I mean, no, what's, what's well, the answer? Well, but, well we would say yours. that God is not so much infinite in time, but he's outside of time and space. He's timeless. He started it. So, so he he's created started. time. Well, that opens well, up a whole... I, I've already touched on that. If you're timeless, that means you're incapable <laughs> of movement. Because movement no. is the measurement of... He's not frozen of, in time. Wait, he's timeless. He's not frozen in time. Right, but if, if time... If he's not under the uh, dictates of time, time is just a measurement of movement through space. Mm -hmm. 24 hours is what time but it takes the earth to do that. But the space didn't exist either. That's what we're saying. If he creates a temporary experiment called time and space. He's outside of Yahweh it. cannot be made of atoms then. No, 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 not. no, yeah, okay. no. Yeah. exactly. And that's where you and this is, that's okay. see, this is where the science were made of atoms. Back up what Spaceless, these, timeless. You've heard the Bill the, These, um, yeah. these um, uh, Bronze Age goat herders that were proposing this were saying that God was Extreme timeless, and now we start to see why it would have to be that way. Because if God was made of atoms, if God was not, if God was something, then it, you, it, I, how do you even have that? 
And I think uh, I think Dr. Sagan in, in Pablo Dot does. You you mentioned earlier the question about controlling, um, in, in, at least in traditional Orthodox Christianity and Judaism, there was never any delusion that that we were trying to control nature, but that Yahweh was always in control of nature. But without without Yahweh, and what you see a lot of in science and te technology, especially, it's very well expressed in this book, and Dr. Sagan's pretty candid about it. Uh, are you comfortable with the way science and technology are developing? He, he talks about this edge about, okay, we develop a nuclear weapon. We can move an asteroid. But if we move an asteroid out of Earth's orbit, or if we explode an asteroid, suddenly we have all these nuclear warheads going around Earth. Who controls that? And so in our attempt to try to control our environment, uh, we are actually, as he says several times in here, if we don't destroy ourselves first. Yeah. He says Sasha that phrase that too. over and over and over again in this book, and the, the da it's a very real question of, okay, we can build atomic bombs, we can build Hubble Space Telescopes. How do we make sure we're building telescopes and not bombs, and if we build bombs to redirect asteroids, who's got their finger on the steering wheel, and who's going to use the bomb? So the problem with, with, with relinquishing God is that man has to sort of take the steering wheel as... Now, no scientist would say, I'm playing God with the universe. Nobody's actually saying that. But in a sense, if there is no God, then we have to preserve ourselves in some way, and the best way that we can think about doing that is through technology, machines, and science. Before, so, before we get too far away from where we were, Ken, I'm sorry we went a little longer than I thought, but I know you've had your hands for a long time. Yeah, what do you think, Ken? Yeah, I guess this ties into an earlier conversation. Uh, you all heard me say amen to her when she said there's a third way that you know we can admit ignorance. I think that's the path of wisdom and humility. Um, now think think of back you know a few hundred years ago or a thousand, couple thousand years ago, when people would get sick. You know there was a question of well what caused that sickness? What caused you to have that fever um, or that epilepsy or whatever it was? And one of the one of the common explanations given was that it was, uh, you know, spiritual demonic forces, uh, demonic possession, and so I think I see that as kind of an analogy of standing in a place where we really don't know what the cause of something is. They had no way to access the real cause of it. They didn't have microscopes. They didn't know what caused it. So they came up with an explanation that satisfied them. Um, and so if somebody had challenged them in their belief that it was demonic possession, uh, the person who believed in, in demons could have said, well, the evidence is the fact that he's writhing and he's falling in the fire, you know, whatever, that's the evidence of the demonic possession, right? So, but, but then the, the skeptic could have said, well, you're just seeing an effect, but you don't know that it was a demon that's causing that, right? And I think it's very similar when we look at the question of how the universe began and why it is the way it is, we stand in a position of ignorance. We don't have the microscopes to really figure it out, right? So, so, and then an atheist says, well, what's your, what's your uh, proof that God created it? Well, look, fine tuning, look, it's big bang, look this, look that. Well, that's the same position as saying, well, uh, we, we see an effect, so we gotta come up with a cause to fill it in. We don't really know, we don't have evidence for the existence of that cause, independent of what we see as effects and we're making a supposition uh -huh. but we don't have direct so what do you think I, I think what you're saying make, make sure i'm understanding correctly that that um there's a tendency on the part of christians to see something that we can't explain right and and seems very uh, impossible <coughs> or improbable highly improbable right. better way to say it right. and and think because it's so improbable and and uh, and so you know shocking that must as evidence for god Right. And uh, I think you're right in the sense that it could be evidence for God, but it may not be evidence for God. Right. And right. so what, what I don't what and I, I what I would say is I have a problem with the opposite of that. We understand a little bit about uh, uh, science and how something happened, so therefore we we know there's no God now. Well, and, you know, and, and, and I think that's that's, that's, that's why it's like three it's like I used to yeah. think that I used yeah. to think that Fords were created by Henry Ford yeah. until I found out about <coughs> internal combustion and about assembly yeah. lines, and I realized that we don't need a Henry well, Ford. Well, that's why she's talking about a third position. Right, I'm, I'm standing behind her. Her I think of that third. How, how many would would with with, uh, with her third position that we, it's okay to say we don't know? How many would agree with her? Absolutely. I think the whole world oh, concurs least. on that. Yeah. I think a fourth oh. position is possible. Uh oh. Uh -oh. Come on. Uh, it's best possible explanation at that time. Okay. And so mm -hmm. position one says faith in this, position two says faith in this, position three says I don't know. 
and position four says, I can go toward this holding it lightly. Mm. And it's a generally accepted. Right. 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 Yeah. 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 Okay, I, 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 would, I would go with that. Yeah. No, it's well, that's, not. Let's... But it's a logical way to go. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, I think um, it, it's actually not totally dependent on the first three. Okay, Chris but trying. it's like version three and a half or something like. <laughs> so, that. Chris, what were you saying? I was going to say I, that way leads to God of gaps issues because when you have an unknown question and all and you're theorizing an all powerful God. God's always going to be the best explanation by default until you mm -hmm. come up with a more mundane explanation. Okay. Well, well, can I, uh, Ken, can, I mean, uh, uh, Chris, for those that are new or something, I know we we dealt with this a lot, but can you just really define uh, God of the gaps for us? God of the gaps is basically saying, I don't know, therefore God did it. It's fitting God into the gaps in our and, knowledge. And mm -hmm. as, as we learn things and find out what really is happening, then the God of the gaps is closed a lot of times. Move God into the next gap or whatever else you still don't. Well, here's know. how. But it, here's, it, here's the here's the doing that too, though. In all fairness, the science of the gap says as we learn more, science will explain everything. This is what comes up in this book. Well, we don't know, but we're going to know. <coughs> and that's, so I think well, it's, it's a we what, have the science of the gaps as well. Well, what's the track record? What's the track record? Well, I haven't quantified that. Mm -hmm. The so, conundrum is when you here's what we know. Here's what we know. Here's because we don't know, and then you find out something, and it's right here. Now you got two gods of the gaps. That's what can happen sometimes. You don't. The gap hardly, inevitably, never gets fully closed. Mm -hmm. it, it sometimes right. gets worse. And with all the things mm -hmm. that we that we like about science, and that we you know, it's self-correcting, it's falsifiable. Things that that we all agree science needs to be that way. But it all it also means because of the very nature of science, which is unavoidable that every model that we currently hold to is going to be out of favor, you know? So whether it's continental drift or, or whether it's, uh, you know, plate tectonics or whatever, the, mo the models have a shelf life. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is you're never arriving at an ultimate truth, but you're hopefully making progress in the area of truth. I was kind of I partial to Newtonian physics. I mean, I don't know why they had to go and complicate it. <laughs> well, I don't think we're saying they're not true. I just yeah. think that they're, they're, they're not, that's not I'd, the whole story. I'd like to suggest that the best possible explanation is how criminal investigations work and how science works. Because you say, okay, we go for this, and we says, well, this is the best explanation we got. Hopefully a police, I was just reading another book that talked about false um, convictions. So, you know, it doesn't always work. But, um, but this is how we operate in general life. We say, what, how, what's the best explanation I have for that? And so on the everyday level, we kind of live that way. And I think too, the science, the, the other question about the gaps question, everything we're talking about, uh, something Sasha concluded that last comment with, uh, is science the requisite determinant for gap in God? I mean, would science be prepared to recognize what evidence for God would look like? That that's the, is the mm, role of science so. appropriate for uh, closing the gap, if you will? That you know, because what we're talking about is scientific knowledge, sort of filling in theological gaps. We said God did this, God did this, God did this. But really, what this implies, but does not say, is how does the scientist know that? God has finally been replaced. That must mean that you you kind of have an idea of what God's nature is if you're replacing it well, with that, something. Well, so not a specific claim, right? If we're talking yeah. about yeah. there, we're talking about where does what makes thunder, and we want to say right. Thor did it, then we can replace that specific God claim with a scientific answer. Right. I don't know, Chris. I don't think it's God replacement. God bowling, and that's when yeah, yeah. Is. <laughs> right, right, right. Oh, yeah. Bob, Bob had a <laughs> statement for us. I have a great deal of fun with this because uh, it's like when this that? evening started. Uh, James, you you asked, um, mm. who are the Christians in the room? Raise your hand. Uh, who are the uh, atheists and the agnostics? Raise your hand. Who raised your hand twice? But you didn't exactly ask who didn't raise their hand at all. Because I saw and, you not raise your hand. Right, you didn't ask who didn't raise your hand. Your hand, and and I didn't raise my I, hand. I apologize for leaving you out. No, no, that's, <laughs> that I think, Bob, you are recognized as the most unbiased person I, in this room. I think, okay. I think it's great because here is the deal. I have a personal belief in God, and I have a personal belief that when I step out of this meat sack, I move on to the next adventure. And I have the universalist um, uh, attitude that we all came from the same place and we go to the same place, whatever the hell we believe and whatever the hell we did. So <clears throat> here's my joy in life. I believe, and that's good enough. 
And I see the humour in, in people that have to have a rule book as to what to believe and how to do it, and people that have to build their knowledge to say someone else is wrong, because I don't give a loop. Well, thanks for that confession. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Michelle had a statement. I just have uh, some thoughts, but no conclusions. Um, one is, of course, if you're defining God as, um, as everything, as something that is everything. No. And, well, if you are, because I didn't really hear a, a full definition of God, and I'm new to this group, so I don't know. We're using the word God, and I'm not hearing how it's being defined here. So when we use it, it's very difficult for me to discern exactly what people are really thinking when the main word being talked about is not clearly defined in my well, mind. Let's define it real quick as a supreme being who is not the creation itself. Not the creation is not outside. Yeah, that's that going to come up as a great view. question because we're going to kind of get into that a little bit with Carl Sagan actually. <laughs> okay. the because there's a question to whether he would be more comfortable identified as a pantheist versus an atheist, and we're going to ask about that. James, we're going to have to call it the atheist the Christian and deist yeah. book club now. There's Leave me alone to have fun. I mean, this is great. So the other thing is, is that with with God, um, if he if he involves everything, okay, then he might also be considered science. He might also be considered Mm -hmm. a cup of tea. He might be considered everything that we do talk about in opposition to God. Also, when Dan was talking about these parallel ways of describing something in the microwave versus the people who uh, cooked it. I believe that we could, if God is infinite, then we could describe God in so in an infinite number of parallel ways. Oh. And it could very well be that everything we're saying tonight is partly, if not fully, a description of God. Well, the, the four sense? kind of views that, Does that make sense? we kind of classify or te- a taxonomy of trying to understand ways of looking at reality, the, the four major ones would be atheism, no God, polytheism, many gods, they're not eternally gods, but many kind of avatars or deities. Um, there's um, theism, the idea that there's one true God, and that that God is all powerful and uh, and infinitely good outside of time and space. And then the other view that we're going to be looking at more next month, but we're going to touch on a little bit this month, is called pantheism. And that's the idea that God is everything and everything is God, but that God is impersonal. So in polytheism, you have personal gods, whether it's Zeus or Aphrodite. When it comes to theism, you have Allah or Yahweh. Uh, and then when it comes to pantheism, mm-hmm. you don't say God, he, you say God, it. This is the, a, only let me... that, the only thing that bothers me about that is that whenever I come to a conclusion about God, I get very nervous because it, it's very doubtful that I have the answer and very doubtful that anybody does. And that's why I did believe in what she said about being mm-hmm. ambiguous. Well, I, I would agree with that, that, that uh, if there is a God who's infinite, then any, any approximation that we have of being able to fully understand God is, is going impossible. to be impossible. It's impossible. Now, it's what, what I would say is it doesn't mean we can know nothing about God. Yeah. Right. But can we fully comprehend God? No, we can't. No, we can know about the microwave and how he boiled water and so on, but there's everything to know. I want to do this. I, w- I want to get to, Chris has a real good question for Sasha coming up next, and I want to okay. do that before our break, but be- before I do that, there's an opportunity we have. I'm not going to say it's a God thing, okay? But I'm saying <laughs> tomorrow afternoon, the Cowboys aren't playing. They're playing tomorrow night, and I'm just saying, you say coincidence, yeah. I say God. But at the, and, and I got this idea actually from Terry. Where did Terry go? Terry, you had the idea I've been looking at ever since you posted it on our, our uh, Facebook oh, page. Uh-huh. Black Holes is playing at UTA tomorrow afternoon at the Planetarium. Oh, man. That's great. And uh, this is, uh, let me just read. The few, few mysteries in the universe have the power and awe of black, the black hole. We are now on the verge of understanding their true nature. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. Sunday, November 10th, that's tomorrow, 1.30 to 2.30. Oh, man, there it comes. It, it, the cost oh, no. is... Five dollars. Five bucks. Six dollars is going no. up a little bit. Six dollars, we could park at our parking lot here and take a car over there to the planetarium. 
if you're interested, I will come back. Uh, and um, if you're interested, let me know if you want to have a, a way I've team. A, I've got a the SUV. I can take about six people. Oh, great. It's okay. And, um, so this is just one it's hour really long? Good. Yes. We did it. About one it hour. Was, yes. It was very informative, but it's a little shallow technically. Uh -huh. uh, you, those of you that have looked at cosmology probably won't learn anything new. But for, for somebody... What is it like visually? Uh, it's It's got a lot of... Good visuals. Okay, I, I I I would be willing if anybody wants to go with me. So yeah. You can think about it. So let me know in the break or at, uh, when we're over. So let's get to our interview. Chris asked a really good question. It touches on morality. And um, are we ready for that? Yeah. Uh, let's let's uh, watch that right now. Hi Sasha, my name is Chris, thank you for taking our questions. Now one issue that's been brought up in our group multiple times is how non-believers can address questions of morality without some sort of God-given framework. I was curious how your father taught you how to be a moral person without referring to divine authority, scripture, or anything of that nature. Great question. So this is, this is my perspective. Every one of us, whether you're religious or secular, there is a framework of do's and don'ts. You know, your the laws of where you live, mm. um, you know, your rules when you're a teenager in your house. And every one of us is deciding which rules to follow and which not to. I mean, n you know, nobody is freaking out about, you know, it's like, okay, thou shall not kill. Great call. Agree. Yeah. Everyone that <laughs> definitely do that. It's a good one. But then it's yeah. like, okay, well, like wearing clothing of mixed fibers, is that real? You know, there's stuff there that's like, you know, the, the you know, working on the, um, um, yeah, you're going into the Old Testament, the right. Old Testament laws. Right. Yeah. But there's yeah. things that were, you know, that, that any, any, you know, more and more, I think, you know, just like anything, like, do you sometimes jaywalk? Do you sometimes go five miles above the speed limit? Do you sometimes, you know, do five? Fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and it's like every one of us has an internal compass that is, you know, um, navigating what we think is really right. We have some degree of empathy. We have some imagination to think, oh, if I do this to this other person, that will be really unpleasant for them. Mm -hmm. Or that nagging feeling when you're like, oh, I don't want to go to this thing, but if I don't yeah. go, this person will be really, really hurt. You know, we all have that in, inside of us, whether or not we um, believe that anyone's supervising. And, mm -hmm. you know, um, it, it, there are people who, you know, in, historically who have been very devout, who have done terrible things. And there have been people who don't believe, who have spent their life giving to others and, and trying to make the world a better place. And I just think there are, there's not, you know, I mean, my parents taught me to be empathetic and kind and grateful for how lucky I was and to remember that the fact that I grew up very privileged um, was, I was extremely lucky and that other people were not so privileged and that it's my duty then to try to make the world a little fairer and to try to do right by, by other people who maybe didn't have it as good as I did growing up. And I don't think that that is, I don't think that you have to, I just don't, I, for me, that, those ideas never came from a religious place. It just came from a place of empathy. And mm. I think that every one of us has that in us to some degree. And sure, some people are sociopaths and they don't, but that's not yeah. because they don't believe, you know, mm. it's mm. because there's something else going on. Yeah, some of you are sociopaths, you know who you are. David Wood was one. But it was interesting in talking to her. Um, I really enjoyed the conversation. It was a lot of fun. Um, she was like that the whole time. 
Um, but it, it was interesting how how she how she was taught and how her dad kind of taught her. There's there's still this a very moral connection for her and her father to the cosmos. I mean, that's Carl's philosophy was that somehow our cosmic perspective of ourselves will sort of give us a moral perspective of ourselves. And her, his daughter is very much breathing that, that same air. If we can just sort of appreciate, understand, and celebrate nature and the cosmos, that we will have some sort of moral sense come out of that. But of course, um, we didn't talk about it in the thing, but that's kind of an is ought dilemma, that, that nature gives you moral oughts. It, 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 <coughs> it cultivates awe and wonder, it certainly, but it doesn't tell me how I should treat Jim or Ron necessarily, but that's kind of was the gist of her, of her position, was that the, that the morality is derived not from Judaic traditions, not from God, as she said, but, but in the appreciation of, of what science has uncovered and the wonders of nature and things of that way. That's kind of how I got the fat feeling she grounded her. So is her morality her just parents. a social construct yeah. based on human thriving? I mean, it, 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 it basically... I, I think that's part of it. Yeah. I think getting from is to odd, which is a, that's a common refrain, it's a good question. But for me, it, it comes down to, uh, it can be that, that conundrum can be broken by prefacing everything with it, if we want, dot, dot, dot. If we want to live in a world where we're not all subject to being murdered by those around us, then, here's, here's where the is becomes mm -hmm. odd, then we ought not to murder each other. You know that we have to proscribe murder. You know, so that's that's kind of what it comes down to. You have to start with an if we want. Do we have time for a quick another one? Yeah, we have a few okay. minutes. Yeah. Um, okay, our our parents, our grandparents, just keep going down the line, right? Depending on or some of you think the Earth is, you know, that humans have only been around six thousand years, but let's let's go with the mainstream that's idea. That's not that true, but the Earth is flat. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so keep going back until <laughs> we're not Homo <laughs> sapiens anymore. Though. When we're Homo habilis, keep going all the way back to Australopithecus. Sometime between Australopithecus afarensis and Homo sapiens sapien, right? There's a lot, of, lot going on there. But at some point, God dropped a soul down in in our brains, right? <laughs> According to the Christians. I mean, Australopithecus. Lucy didn't have a soul. Well, we yeah, can all agree. I mean, on that. We, Christians, regardless of. Uh, there's a lot of diversity, but I, I, I'm almost really, every Christian is going to say there's I, a difference between a human and an animal. That we share a lot of things in common, well, we are animals, but there is but something I what you're saying. That, okay. that only the humans are Imago Dei, in the right. image of God. So but yes, I'm, I'm really oversimplifying this yes. just to get it out, but at some point in human evolution, souls got dropped in our cranium. Prior to that, societies were, be, were you know, society. our ancestors were living in societies. Societies as mutual you, you okay you're going to gather you're going to you know you're going to hunt you're you know you're going to build the fire i mean th that's a given before the souls before romans before um what what's the verse where you know, we just know it in our hearts kind of thing you know you guys know that verse the, the law is written in our hearts yeah before that romans before the soul was dropped down in our heads we were still forming societies and and we weren't murdering each other then so what's changed oh, what's the difference were. Oh, uh, of course, we're, we are now. But they were then. But it, there, there was, it, it, was, uh, yeah. it was against the rules but back I, then. What he's saying much. is, we would look at the animal kingdom, right? You go to, you go to the um, to Africa and you see, you know, the... Um, uh, the gorillas. The, well, the killing, you know, you, you eat to stay alive. We don't see a moral problem there. We don't say the lion is immoral for killing the gazelle. We see that that is just but they a don't brute kill their own line. pride. But even Usually. if they did, we wouldn't see it as a moral issue. Some because we would, we would make a distinction between animals and humans. Morality changes. But there was some semblance of a morality. Otherwise, civ earliest civilizations could have never even got off the ground. And this is before souls got put in our brains. Okay. But the problem is, is so if, if you're saying that, so then there was a point in time that murdering your own tribe was okay. Murder is a legal term. What, what you, look, say murder, it with killing. Kill. Kill. Well, there's a difference between okay. killing and murdering. But, right. All right, so then there would be a time where that was okay. There would be a time where it was okay to torture your baby for fun. If that, what you're saying yeah, is true. That yeah, would be I, logic I, play that's out. an often used hypothetical. You already see it in the animal kingdom now. You see, you see it now. You see the, uh, you know, the uh, animals that will kill their own and... And, um, oh yeah, it happens all the time. Yeah. I mean, if you want to, look, I, I, this is what but I'm, I'm talking it about. Our ancestors. It's, it's hard to ground morality in Darwinianism because yeah, I see a, 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 a kill and be killed world out there in which I don't see morality ruling. I see 
power is what is what I rules. think we ought to read Mama's Last Hug by um, Franz de Waal. He's a primatologist who knows what primate what primates how uh -huh. they behave and how they right. feel about each other. He's more than probably anybody on the planet. He knows what's in the heads of, of these animals. That must be fascinating. And they do have they do have a sense of, of group morality and uh -huh. they have proscriptions and they have punishments and they have retribution. They have revenge, they have hopes, they have dreams, they have they have pretty, pretty they much have everything honor. that we have. Honor. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we, would you would you say that that comes from uh, evolution genetics and, and um it comes from being a social or? species where you have to get along and live thrive together. I mean a animals that are not social species like Certain Insects, cat, cats, or even probably cats. have a less less <laughs> well, cats. less developed <laughs> sense of morality than. Uh, but if you if you go to the out my yeah. if you go to the zoo, the primate cage, the primates <laughs> stick their rear end out at you. You know, Bees <laughs> because they're in captivity. Yeah, so <laughs> <because of> fairness, <laughs> did you watch the video of the yeah, no, I'm, monkeys throwing? Yeah, the know, throwing the poo at each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. a sense of fairness. I would say I think most Christians agree that all dogs go to heaven, all cats go to hell. <laughs> <laughs> no, but James, you got to have uh, something you have to make strings for the harps in heaven, so you have to have cats. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh. oh. I, think, I, think the, I think that I think that for me, just for me, the evolutionary construct of, of our ancestral past. I, Dr. Satan talks about it a little bit, a couple of paragraphs. He doesn't go into it that much in this book, but you know, you're talking about oftentimes the the synopsis, the historical synopsis of our evolutionary development spans hundreds of thousands, millions of years, and oftentimes they're described in textbooks or even very well written text on, on evolution, this, this, as you say, Jim, these huge swaths of time are described very compactly, where there's a lot of uh, text missing, I guess you can say. So there's, there's a lot of stuff missing from that continuum, if there is a continuum. I'm not saying that there is or isn't, but there's just a lot of uh, historical information, we might say, that's missing, minus some bones and pottery and some primitive graves. but. Um, I think there's a lot in that narrative that's that's missing that would fill in the gaps, right? We're sort of, it's sort of kind of like filling in the gaps of how we think things happen, but it is still kind of gapish in a way. Let's do this. We're going to take a break in just a second, and um, we have some coffee in there, and we have some dessert as well. I think some Ooh, cobbler, cobbler. and right. uh, restrooms are down that hall on the left. But before Pale we do, do I, cobbler. I, I, <laughs> I want to have one more because Jim has a really, really good question, and it's only a three-minute little video clip, and it will give us something to talk about coming back out of break. So um, are we ready for that right now? Okay, so this is uh, Jim's question to Sasha. That's a good one. Hi, Sasha. It's Jim Hall here, host of a webcast called Atheist Edge. My question for you is this. Carl seemed hesitant to identify as an atheist, and some reporters have even indicated that he rejected the label agnostic, although many might describe him as something of a pantheist given his deep reverence and awe for the universe. Philosophically, atheism is best described as a direct no answer to the question, do gods exist? By this strict definition, neither I and I would guess your father are atheists. However, there is a colloquial definition that is simply a lack of belief in deities. Do you think Carl had reluctance to identify as an atheist because he adhered only to the more formal definition and disregarded the common parlance? Or was it possibly that he maybe thought the term atheist was too provocative or confrontational and didn't fit his gentle nature. Uh, thanks so much for answering my question and take care. That's a great question and he did have a really gentle nature. Um, mm. Yeah, I think that, you know, he was a scientist and, that, and it, again, maybe there's a word missing here for what it's called when your worldview is science and I would just say he would say that he would withhold belief without evidence and so mm -hmm. yeah no i don't think that i don't think that he w would um have described himself as being an atheist in the sense of having total conviction that there was no god but yeah. just the idea that we don't have any evidence to support that and human beings have the tendency to um 
you know, without without looking at the things that we can measure and prove, um, it's hard to know what's real. And that's what he was really truly interested in was what was true, what was verifiably provably true. Mm. Um, and that's that's what his life's work was was about was understanding that and celebrating it because yeah. it he, for him and for me the things that that we've been able to discover through the scientific method as a species are so often more astonishing and breathtaking than uh, than anything that we have we humans come up with on our own yeah, yeah. Let's do this. Let's go ahead and take our, our break, and we'll be back uh, in a quarter after. Welcome back to the Atheist and Christian Book Club, a monthly gathering of both atheists and Christians who respectfully discuss important books from both perspectives. Uh, I'm James Walker, co-founder of the club, a president of Watchman Fellowship, a Christian apologetics ministry. Our other co-founder is Bill Cluck, former Christian now. Repro uh, uh, atheist. <laughs> Reprobate. Oh, no, he was going to say representing. Oh, representing. Yeah. And we were just yeah. talking about morality. Representative. Yeah. <laughs> well done. Representative of both agnostic and atheist. I think you were Well, yeah, it's funny. Todd goes, well, they're atheists. What do you expect? I mean, oh, is yeah. that a little bit marginalizing? Oh, yeah. okay. you know? it is, uh, okay. Well, I think I can speak, <laughs> I can speak for a, a, a lot of Christians who say, I, I know atheists who are, are more moral than some Christians that I know. Sure, so. Um, I, I, you can be a moral person without believing in God. Well, thank so you. For the that. better question is, where? How do you ground the morality? Where does it come from? That, and that is a question worth asking. But whether or not you can be moral and not believe in God, I think we all agree that the answer is yes on that. So we never get anywhere with this morality thing. So what I'd like to talk about is the book. And it's funny when I have a question. This what I asked Dan just now was the shoemaker Levy comment. Co believe that in 1994 it hit Jupiter and they thought it was a smudge on their telescopes right well that shoemaker Levy saw a, a string of lights in the telescope that looked like a long streak and then more and more telescopes focused on this they saw that it was a, a pr fragments of something that Jupiter's gravity had broken up and these fragments a loosely correlated comet or an asteroid or something was broken apart some of these fragments were earth sized uh, at, least, size. at oh. least the impact crater, the impact marks on Jupiter's southern hemisphere were the size of Earth. Okay. So how big these rocks were, actually they weren't sure, but they, they were able to train every telescope uh, on, this, on this impact, and it was a phenomenal event that was... Uh, so what you ask yourself, if that could happen to Jupiter, could it, and it has happened on Earth. You're all familiar with the KT not one that big. meteorite. Uh, well, the KT meteorite was big enough to uh, extinguish the dinosaurs. Well, yeah, but it went as big as Earth. Oh, right. 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 No, exactly. <laughs> what, we, what we were more, what we had suspected, I say we had scientists suspected, but now we had more confirmation of, was that uh, Uranus, Neptune, uh, and Jupiter are, are basically, so this is, this is really fascinating because I just talked to Guillermo Gonzalez, like I said earlier, uh, Guillermo, the, 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 there's been about 4,000 extrasolar planets that have been discovered in the last decade. Uh, that's in, the technology has increased, our better technology, the more planets we're discovering. What, we're, what they found, and this is right from the direction, right from the, directly from Guillermo, who is a planetary scientist, is that we used to think our solar system, talk about anthropocentrism, we used to think our solar system was, was standard. This is how things are. Rocky planets toward the sun, gas giants out on the peripheral. That's just standard solar system fare. This is exactly the opposite. Every extra solar system that we have found, gas giants near their parent star, rocky planets like Mars, Venus, Mercury, and Earth on the exterior, mm. on the outside. It's exactly inverse. Um, but what, we, what Shoemaker Levy and what Bill is talking about had established more thoroughly that we'd already suspected is that the gas giants on the outer edge of our solar system are act as sentinels and they are vacuum cleaners and they deflect and they prevent and they shield us from these earth size and other world ending uh, asteroids and comets that come into our atmosphere that's why saturn has rings probably that's why jupiter has 64 moons uh they collect stuff and the outside of our solar system and prevent the big stuff from coming on the inside and it's one of the reasons why I think uh, you know it's why I think the universe is designed that's an awfully wonderful happenstance if it's not but um well, that so, if it was huge you think it'll fall into the sun and you'll survive yeah it's bigger than 
And but in it, Vegas, we're far enough away not to get into it. In the book, it says every 20,000 years or so, we're going to have a civilization ending uh, comet. Something like that, but 200. Well, civilization, not um, extinction level. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. But, but we've I mean, only ever had one civilization, though, right? Sorry. Oh. We yeah, but I mean, <laughs> so we're well, due. We're overdue. So right? We're overdue. Yeah, yeah, so some like, some <laughs> will question this one. <laughs> but <laughs> to, you had the Permian extinction like uh, two, million, 2 million years ago, where it knocked out like 95% of species. Then you had the 65 million years ago, you had the Yucatan. But yeah, the Permian was like 2 billion. Yeah, two, 2 million. Permian well, was million. way on back. No, it was way, it was far Well, whatever. I mean, the whole point <laughs> is, is, is God going <laughs> to... <laughs> what did the trilobites do? Two <laughs> was there a trilobite civilization? <laughs> oh, come on. I mean, Dan, is God going to go <laughs> and say, look, I'm going to give him a pass because, you know, that last one was a... A monster hit, you know, that I let go, or is it just? Are we going to be like Jupiter and God's just going to let us get wiped out? Well, I think, uh, according to the, according to Revelation, the, the Earth is going to be burned up but not completely destroyed and recreated. That is the hope. Uh, the new like and the new earth. So he's not going to give us a pass. He's going to. I don't know how. They, but it'll be fire. He'll, he'll give us a pass. It sounds like. Oh, 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 uh, so question, question from Ken, everybody. It came to me as I was listening. I listened to the audible version of, of the book, and he was talking about how you know the need for going out and creating these these uh, external outposts, yeah. uh, motivations to kind of protect us from inevitable doom that's going to come down the road at some point from an asteroid or whatever. And it, uh, so my question to, mm. to Christians is, do you all think that's something that's worth investing in, given that maybe you believe that Jesus is coming back around the corner, maybe this generation or next generation. That's a good question, yeah. to Is it a waste about? of money? I I would think, it was it was there more or is it? That was kind of the gist okay. of it, yeah. Well, I think it, I think it was Martin Luther, and you probably know this quote, mm -hmm. but if I think it may have been Augustine or one of the earlier mm -hmm. saints uh, that he said if he knew this was the last night on earth, he'd plant an apple tree. Luther. Was that Luther? Yeah, yeah. and I think... I think, uh, I mean, you've seen it, Ken, in your missionary work that you, you hear somebody calling out, hey, next Tuesday is it, and then what, what the, the frenzy that is unleashed of people doing all kinds of stuff. But I, I, I am of the mindset, maybe other people are different, I would keep doing what I'm doing as I'm doing it. Uh, I mean, and, and I think that, I think space exploration is, uh, it's, he talks about, he, has, he goes on in, I think, the last couple of chapters of trying to, he has a very difficult time trying to justify expenditures for, you know, ultimately when you go to NASA, the government, you ask for money, it's like, why are you doing this? Why do you want to go live on an asteroid? Why do you want to go to Mars? Why do you want to go to the moon, right? It was easy to go to the moon because the Russians, right? We had a, we had an arch enemy, we like, like, we have to beat them. For all mankind. Uh, we have to smite them for Sputnik, right? We, they got 1957, they got Sputnik up in there, and they beat us, and so we got to beat them bad. We got to, we got to send 12 men to the moon, and, uh, but now, now we're now we're piggybacking on Russian equipment, you know. Uh, but I I'd say I think it's wonderful. I think for me as a Christian, it it, it, it of course it, it shows the glory of God. That's not why NASA is going to go out and explore everything. No. But as long as they keep doing that, I'm like yeah. cool. Look at so, that. But, but yeah. to clarify, so you you are on board with with uh, Sagan's rationale for wanting to go out into the outer reaches of the solar system and and, and plant ourselves in these you know these outer outlying uh, worlds he calls them uh, for the purpose for the sole purpose not sole purposes but principally for the purpose of protecting ourselves against devastation oh well now now I don't I, I don't think we're gonna protect ourselves by living on an asteroid I don't think we're gonna protect ourselves from living on Mars and so no I wouldn't agree with nuclear arms in space or trying to redirect asteroids I but but exploration mining you know, perhaps uh, new technologies and things like that. So yeah. you're, you're, you're in favor of exploration, but not the rationale that he gives, which is to, to protect ourselves. Yeah, because that gets so, into the issue of, I, of trying to control. Yeah, if, if I can answer that, discovery. Um, you know, I'm not represent Christianity or anything, I mean, but, but well, you on the one hand kind of, that I really <laughs> like about, and still like yes. about Carl Sagan, is his ability to inspire. And like I said, you, you finish the book and I'm thinking, Whatever we're spending on NASA, multiply by ten. Yeah. You know, because. It, it, but that subtitle of this book about and the really chap the final chapter about being able to preserve our species by 
basically um, not having all our eggs in one basket. If we have people right, living out yeah. here, humans living out here. That's what I'm I understand about. the theory. Yeah. I'm not opposed to it as a theory. I'm not opposed at all to it as a theory. But it was one of the most disappointing parts of the book to me. Because while he starts off in the early chapters talking about and, and inhabit other planets and other stars, not yet. Well, that's okay. That sounds like we're almost there. But then as you read the book, you find out well, initially we thought that maybe Jupiter or Mars would be, you know, life support. Maybe life's already there. Uh, you have the right, what is it, a, a yellow dwarf, the right star. It's about the right distance. It's a rocky planet. It has an atmosphere. All these things going for it. And then you get there and find out that uh, it, you're going to melt lead on the surface of it, you know. So it's just like it, 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 he's, he gives no hope for anything in this solar system except maybe one of the star, one of the That's moons right. of Saturn. Mm -hmm. Okay, so and then and he talks about the great distance and all. It's like, how many of you thought like we're, we're not yet was where we are on being able to get outside of our of our of our uh, solar system oh. to the nearest star and seeing if we can find a, an inhabitable planet there. I was left very depressed, like, that's not going to happen. Tim, well, what do you think? I'm Tim. right with them. The, All right, the, the, agreement. the distances are too great. Yeah. Yeah. We are so mm -hmm. close to AI singularity. I think that's the eggs. That's the basket I'm putting my eggs in. It'll figure things out. And if it can't figure out a way for us squishy meat bags to get out and colonize, it'll find a way for it, because AI is immune to gamma uh, solar radiation. It can travel huge distances, and it it doesn't have to breathe. Uh, you know, it doesn't have to breathe oxygen. It, it, and and if they're self-replicating, you could have the entire this galaxy and then beyond populated. It wouldn't would, be would human, say, but it would be. Would something. you define that as as a uh, Darwinian ex extension of humans? Is wow. this, is this how we evolve? There's no genetic material in, in AI. But, does, but you're but, there but it's a different like a, form. Maybe there's yeah, but but yeah. does it's that even product. matter? It's 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 the thoughts. It's it's the the culture. It's the, it's, it's the, been RNA, self replicating RNA, and then DNA. It's been DNA this whole time. So you got to think outside the box at that point. Yeah. So does, so does AI become the new, new DNA? Looks like because it's going to happen in our well, lifetime. Get ready. Think? I see that negativity about uh, space travel uh, as being a lack of faith in human nature. Is what I see. I mean. Um, you know, we we are inquisitive. We mm, the human race was born to discover. Heck, you know, Columbus jumped on a ratty old ship and discovered the United States. We wouldn't be here. But the thing is, you know, it's the old adage: when they discovered atomic energy, it was supposed to be a wonderful thing for humanity, and it killed millions. So, so that is what I see about the negativity. The, the, but the there's, a, there's a reason for that. The nearest star is four light years, and that doesn't sound like much, but the sun is eight light minutes, which is 93 million miles. So if you had a light day, it would be billions of miles. That's just a day. The, the nearest star is well, right up the Centauri 4. So is there any possible way going? And that's going at the speed of light. And I understand that, but, but there's many people that believe that we are not the only... Uh, species, right, but it's which just means that we likely are not the most uh, um, progressed species. So there are there are uh, uh, civilizations that can travel billions of miles no, per I'm, hour. Maybe it is. Time. Time. <laughs> you can't one time. travel it is the line. What's your evidence so, for that? So, well, wait a minute. Let's ask, ask someone that knows. Okay, Daniel, what's the point? What's the Is Is it feasible <laughs> to go to the nearest star? <laughs> Demons. <laughs> and go and have another civilization. Okay, so one of the things I learned from talking to Guillermo is that, okay, so there's we have telescopes trained on extrasolar planets. So things that we have observational astronomy has seen, not theoretical, not, not philosophical, not Matt Damon and the Martian, uh, planets that we have seen uh, with, our, with telescopes that, that are around stars where we're looking for habitable zones. Mm -hmm. um, and so the observational astronomers are not finding anything, even. Yeah. but you hear Earth-like a lot. Yeah. And this is kind of almost, in a sense, uh, Bob, almost, and if you talk to people in the trenches who do observational astronomy, it's kind of propagandistic clickbait. 
to say something is Earth-like, because as Guillermo says, he says, to me, Earth-like is where I can raise rabbits and tomatoes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> not something that has a little blue circle around it that I can see from 110 light years away. But here's the problem, um, that the, the distance is, is nearly insurmountable. Um, there's, there's absolutely based on what we know. Based on what we know, we, we, we have would not have developed to, warp propulsion. Yet. No. <laughs> no. The, the, the other thing off, is that th these distances <laughs> limit our ability to see <laughs> to, to be able. To, so, so for example, if we're looking at our solar system right. from another solar system doing exoplanet research, let's just say that that existed, they would see, they might see Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. They might see that as we see planets in their system. And they and we're all kind of cozied into this little habitable zone according to their science, mm -hmm. but look at the absolute radical difference between Venus and Earth. I mean, Venus has an atmosphere that's 900, or I don't know, it's 100 times, times uh, 90, 90 times, times uh, more dense than Earth. It crushed the Russian uh, lander when it landed there. Um, the surface temperature is unbearably almost Burn. molten, um, and it's our twin, twin, and it has an atmosphere. Um, and we can't tell from these distances what, what are on these worlds. But another, yeah. another factor, too, is because of the, the distance of, of the speed of light, if we were, did have the technology to spot a perfect planet that we did know supported life, if we have them here on Earth, by the time we got there, it wouldn't be there anymore. Well, we're, exactly. we're, we're missing out on something here. <clears throat> we, we don't have the, the technology, I understand, to travel at those speeds. Um, but we keep saying, you know, well, well they've got that they don't see any evidence of it. Um, you know, but when, each time we've come out with a new aircraft of some kind, maybe they go a little faster. Maybe they carry a little bit more electronics. But the technology they've worked towards is stealth. Well, Bob, let me but get, have, let me get ahead of us for just a minute. You'd have to be this is something that I'm debating, and we've talked a little bit about, about a book for January or February. Um, maybe not doing a book, but doing a documentary. Have any of you seen Tran uh, Transcendent Man? No. Um, Transcendence with Johnny Depp? No, no, oh. no. no. <laughs> Transcendent. <laughs> that uh, was a good movie. Oh, you like Johnny Depp? This is, uh, uh, this is a movie. Was an awesome movie. A the girls like Johnny Depp, sorry. Um, <laughs> It's basically, uh, it's the guy who invented synthetic speech for computers and the, the, the uh, digital keyboards, the, um, oh, I, I can't remember his, what his name is. Kurtzweil. Right Kurtzweil. Ray Kurtzweil. Oh, yeah. Ray Kurtzweil. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Viking Man. Basically, oh, there's two factors going on in the documentary. One of them is, uh, with the tech, the key, and I think what you're talking about is that we can't have incremental growth in our technology. It has to be, it, ha it has to have a tipping point of being exponential. Mm. And so what he says is, if, if you look over the last 200 years, uh, human life has increased tremendously. Uh, you know, the average age of, a, of an adult male, 40, 42, 38 years old, and now it's 85 years old if you live in the western part of the world. But most of that growth's happened just in the last 75 years. And so what he's, what one of his theories is, there's going to come a time as, as the technology progresses in medicine and, and the breakthroughs we're having in DNA and all the other kinds of new technology, that one day is going to come when the average lifespan for, an, for a human is going to go in one year to 366 days more than it was. And that's what he calls Methuselah so I'll principle. Yeah. Yeah. And so you basically have, have at least theoretical immortality at that point. Now, the other thing he talks about is being able, as a backup plan, because he says he think, doesn't think he's going to live long enough, but it's possible because the way that the technology is, you're doubling every couple of years now. And so he says that, you, and this goes back to the AI factor, you can digitize yourself. All, every thought could become ones and zeros. You can... Um, you can uh, map your DNA. You can you can basically back yourself up and restore yourself later. If you've ever done that and survived a computer crash, and you know how valuable that can be. Um, so it's not a book. It's a it's a documentary. I, I watched it about five years ago, and I, it still comes to mind from time to time. And it but it would talk about some of these things. It, he has a very optimistic view of technology, and he, he believes that there's reason, he, ha, he has reasons why he thinks it will be good, used for good and not evil. And, uh, and, and that what we have to have to be able to 
transcend, so to speak, and be able to have life anywhere else on any other planet or any other asteroid or any other, especially another star, we would have to have a type of technology that's exponential, that, that basically not incremental, like we, <coughs> we have a car that goes a little bit faster than the one last year. It needs to be doubling every every 18 months or There's so. There's an excellent book, uh, so I'll just, 10 seconds. There's an excellent book that was written by uh, a British philosopher named Mary Midgley called Science as Salvation. Mm. And uh, she was one that challenged Richard Dawkins early on when he came out with God Delusion just on the philosophy aspect of it. But she says something very poignant in that book, and I think it's very true, that there's no machine, that science isn't capable of saving us because science is a human endeavor, and when human beings make machines or technology, they embed their own fallibility and error into the technology they're making. So the technology can never sort of transcend and do the transcendent, transcendent yeah, things that we want it to do. And, so, and you seeing as do you, do you save yourself or do you save the world? Right, exactly. Well, and yeah. seeing as you're looking at me, I'm going to do a 10 second comeback. Um, uh, I was just, uh, and it sounds very juvenile, but, but I can almost <laughs> see this picture of other uh, civilizations watching us and going, I can't believe they're still doing that shit. You know, we're, we're so far behind the technology curve and, and they just, can't, we, we look at some people and go, well, that's really juvenile. Why are you doing that? That's think, so, uh, so old. I think, and I think we're way behind the technology. Minus the, minus the, as a species. The swear word, I think that's what God says all the time. He knows the answer to the question, <laughs> though. Based on our current technology, it would take, Dan, help me out here, like uh, tens of thousands of years to get to the nearest what we hope would light be. Light years, Jim. Light years. No, he's saying and no. Uh, so oh, yeah, 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 okay, yeah, yeah. Let's yeah. Say, based on yeah, yeah, yeah. It would take a long time. Well, we forget the fact that if it took that long to get there, that that means that uh, all those tens of thousands of years they're reproducing on this ship. They're they've got an enclosed <laughs> ecosystem, right? It's an enclosed. So if you got an enclosed ecosystem, you're self-sustaining. You're reproducing. You're doing everything. You, why why do you need our planet to? Why not just colonizing the ships themselves? That comes back to Ken's question. And, yep. that is, and my question is, human nature having been proven for thousands of years at least to be uh, faulty, why would it be different on a colony on another planet? No. Well, that seems to and be Jim's, just, but that's a good it just question. It your chances yeah, of Jim's, survival. Jim's though. question, it shows how this can never work. How many of you have ever been on a trip to Disneyland with your family or something? Oh. Mm -hmm. A long trip? Like, you that's know, all saying it's a work. small, small world. Well, no, they, they on the <laughs> no, spaceships, <laughs> they were at each other's throats. No, have you guys heard this? Megan wasn't talking about a spaceship. He was talking about a like, asteroid, yeah, yeah. pushing the asteroid yeah. and letting it, you know, people just live there. Yeah. Uh, you know, for thousands. I did. Years, uh, I did. I watched. Like, some, Sasha's going to be asked the same question, uh, so let's. We, yeah. we can see in a minute. How um, she but I have, any of you seen The Martian with Matt Damon? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay, so that. I watched yeah. that with a friend of mine last night as I was reading this and preparing, and I thought I kept thinking to myself, it was, I like that movie. It's a really good movie. Um, what I kept thinking was this very idea that I was reading in Pale Blue Dot. Everything on that planet had to be transported. Mm. Everything at, a, at, an, at an amazing amount. I mean, he has Sagan in here breaks down the cost of how much it costs to move a kilogram of stuff out there. I don't forget what the cost was, but it was like uh, that's why we're not out there more than the price of gold. because it's more than yeah. the price of gold. Getting right, mm. and and so I'm thinking to myself of that quote as I'm watching The Martian going. I want to see the movie that explains how you got all that stuff there. <laughs> <laughs> how about this? And then we'll go into the, the whole survival. Another whole factor you know. about this. How many of you followed the story? On the uh, on the dome, what is it called? The the There were two of them, and I don't remember the details. It's been a long time since I looked at it, but you can go to Wikipedia. It was a joke. They didn't work from day one, and you can have all the material on Earth. You don't have to launch it. You just have to take it and build it and seal it. They cheated. They they uh, they made uh, they they broke it. Out. They had stuff smuggled into them. You know, it's just like and so you're but you're going to do this on an asteroid. No, you can't. And they'd all get along. 
We didn't kill each other. There will never be any sins of sex, power, or money. You know, we should bring primates to the asteroid. Let's just let them do their thing. You would have to go into cryogenics, right? You'd have to just freeze There you go. Cryogenics, I like that. And how gulps of the timer that's freezing out. There are cryogenic labs where people really, I think there's a lot of wealthy people that One more thing since we're talking about Voyager. How many remember V'ger? Star Trek. V'ger. Star Trek. You see how bad these things can go? Mm-hmm. <laughs> that was the original Star Trek movie, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. Yes. It was the Star Trek. I think yeah. humans yeah. have human Beecher. problems wherever we live. Yeah. And by the way, just I, you prop some. Most of you are second fans. You know this, but uh, uh, just fun fact: uh, Sasha's half brother Nick from Carl's first marriage. His voice is on the golden record. He's the child that says hello oh, wow. from Earth. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. So she, it was fun to have her tell me that. That's a good bar, man. That was cool. That was cool. Yeah, so yeah. since Dan brought up a movie, I think I'd like to recommend a, a show called The Expanse. It's on Amazon uh, okay. Prime Video. But it's like 200 years in the future, and it's, they're colonizing the asteroid belts and Mars, and they've got all these different colonies. It reminded me a lot of when I was listening to the Pale Blue Dot on Audible. Yeah. That the, the the civilization that that Sagan was envisioning, they must have ripped it off and Sagan just just done over. it, and yeah. put yeah, it in there. It's completely a mirror image of what it's on. Uh, Prime, Amazon Prime. Is yeah, it a yeah. single movie? We're gonna have to pick series. up the pace because we have two more in, short seasons. interviews to listen to. So, so let's do this right now. This is uh, yeah, the expanse. Uh, this is uh, Sasha, um, and again, her book, and we might want to do this book next year too. It's called For Small Creatures Such as We, which is one of her father's lines. Mm -hmm. Which really goes back to Pale Blue Dot. This is from uh, Contact, the movie yeah. Contact. Insignificant, and that would be another great book to do, perhaps. But anyway, what we want to do on this one, I, I, I'm going to ask her about, uh, does the cosmos um, and this idea of interplanetary or, or um, be it colonizing the cosmos, does this give us a hope for some kind of tacit immortality? Um, maybe not for individuals, but for the species at least. And so. just to set this up a little bit, we, Sasha and I talked a little bit at the front end about uh, her and her father's idea of immortality. So this clip kind of comes on, uh, on the tail of that. The book was written, her book was written at, after an article that was in the New Yorker, uh, New York Magazine, I'm sorry, New York Magazine, which got widespread appeal and was picked up and, and republished in a lot of different uh, venues. But in that, she talked about when she first found out that we were going to die and the conversation she had with her father about could we live again and how he answered that. And I don't want to put words in her mouth or anything, but it's, it, when you read the article, it's kind of like she never got over that. Not, not really. And so um, and she's still wrestling with how, how you deal with that. So that, that, that's why I, I asked this question. So let's, let's watch that now. Sasha, thanks so much for taking a few moments of your time to talk with us at the Atheist and Christian Book Club as we discuss your father's book, Pale Blue Dot. And on page 332 of his book, uh, your dad quotes Charles Lindholm, who's a professor of anthropology at Boston University. And, and he quotes uh, the professor saying, in modern Western society, the erosion of tradition and the collapse of accepted religious beliefs leaves us without a telos or an end to which we strive, a sanctified notion of humanity's potential. Bereft of a sacred project, we have only a demystifying image of a frail and fallible humanity, no longer capable, capable of becoming God-like creatures. Then your father makes an interesting comment of, about Professor Lindholm's quote, uh, as narrated by your mother. I believe it is healthy, indeed essential to keep our frailty and fallibility firmly in mind. I worry about people who aspire to be godlike. But as for a long-term goal and a sacred project, there is one before us. On it, the very survival of our species depends. If we have been locked and bolted into a prison of the self, here is an escape hatch, something worthy, 
something vastly larger than ourselves, a crucial act on behalf of humanity. Peopling other worlds unifies nations and ethnic groups, binds the generations, and requires us to be both smart and wise. It liberates our nature and, in part, returns us to our beginnings. Even now, this new telos is within our grasp. Uh, my question is this, Sasha. Do you, do you think that your father's, uh, this vision of peopling other worlds and his call for a human future in space, maybe in some ways uh, may have been an attempt to create a transcendent purpose, uh, a hope for some type of immortality, if not for him personally, for humanity, humankind as a whole? It's a matter of survival a little bit longer, not forever, mm. because even if we don't destroy ourselves and we manage to move, you know, to another mm. planet that's habitable and lovely, um, and we are not here when in five billion years the sun um, implodes and makes it very, uh, I mean, impossible to stay, um, we still, it won't be immortality because our species will evolve. And we will change into something else. Hey, Sasha, thanks and so we'll much for taking. Oh wait, <laughs> we <laughs> that's will okay. Go ahead. Into, no, it's fine. I'll go back a little so you can edit. Um, <laughs> we will. I, I used to be a TV producer, so I, <laughs> I know. Um, Sorry. So even if we make it possible for us um, to leave this this world and and you know move to another planet that's habitable mm -hmm. and lovely, and we are not here on this on this planet and the solar system when the sun in five billion years-ish um, implodes and, and makes it not very nice to stay. Um, wherever we are, we, we will evolve eventually into something else and we mm. will become a species that no longer reveres what we revere. Um, we will, our values will change, our um, ideas will change and we will not be recognizable. I mean, not we, they will, will not recognize us um, as their brethren. I mean, will they carry maybe some of the, the genetic material? Sure. Um, but there, to me, I mean, is it immortality if we would not recognize them as part of us? I don't think so. But I also think that survival, you know, that's that is the driving force of so much of what we do as a species and it's it's i mean it's central to to our behavior and to what we value and um you know i i think a lot of what i write about is the idea that even if it's all chance and chaos and nothing happens for a reason the fact that any of us are alive right now is worthy of celebration and wonderful mm. and so yeah i think being alive is great and i think it would be wonderful if we could you know make it possible to 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 survive a little longer but i think that's different than immortality Fun I fact on the movie. I heard the book is a lot better. Fun it's fact really on Contact. It took 17 <laughs> years to make. But the book is awesome. And uh, the movie was begun, and then Carl and his wife Anne decided to make write the book. So it wasn't like the book existed, then the movie. It was always supposed to be a movie. And then Carl and Anne, and, and Sasha told me that, that Carl and Anne worked together on writing the book. And for small creatures such as we, uh, the vastness is only bearable through love was Anne Druyan's line in Contact that she wrote it in Contact but it took 17 years to make the movie and it came out in the summer of 1997 uh, and Carl had died in December of 1996 so he didn't even get to he see it he never saw it, it. 
I remember there was the remembrance to him at the end yeah. of the credits. Oh, mm -hmm. that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. yeah. That was powerful on so many different levels. That oh, yeah. It was as it's layers to it. You, you go back and watch it a second time and you're picking up all this stuff you didn't catch the first time. And uh, in the beginning, if you have the book, the book is dedicated to Alexandra. That's, That's Sasha. Sasha. That's her. Oh, oh no. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> so, so, so you're saying that the book is, is way better even than yes. the movie? Yes. Yes. Huh. I, I've not read the book, but book that's is, book is, that's I mean I I fell in love it? with the yeah. And the book superseded the Do you movie. The book came after the movie. Oh, yeah. While the it's movie was being crazy. produced because yeah. the movie took Forty seventeen years. Ken Thank has a theme song. Well I have the lyrics to a Keith Green song that ties yeah. into the interview that was just Oh, you're a Christian. Yeah, I don't know if it's appropriate for a non believer Oh, that's okay. We, we cite atheists all the time. I certainly agree with it. I mean, even though it's... Well, that's wonderful. So, well, you can run to the end of the highway and not find what you're looking for. Moving won't make your troubles disappear. And you can search <laughs> to the end of the highway and come back no better than before. To find yourself, you got to start right here. Uh, uh, you say you want to hit the road because life is so deceiving. Do you think it's different at the other end? So you can run to the end of the highway and not find what you're looking for. Moving won't make your troubles disappear. <laughs> um, and it goes on and on. You, you say you want to find a place where people are not lying. If you find a place like that, I'll go there too. You know, so we can we can run to the end of the universe, yeah. and we'll still be us. I where met people, uh, where people are not lying. I met uh, the word lying. Oh, lying. lying. I met uh, uh, Apollo Amen. sixteen astronaut uh, 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 Charlie Duke, who was the voice of Same Apollo Eleven Houston. Yeah. yeah. And he gave a testimony at a men's Bible study a couple of years ago. That's where I met him, and he was talking about. Everybody, you know, he became a Christian shortly after he, well, he was a lukewarm Christian, went to the moon and came back and he was sort of, he had a, a, a salvation experience he testifies to. But it's interesting when he talked about being on the moon, he's like, it's the moon. <laughs> I mean, he, <laughs> well, to Ken's point and to Keith's green point, it's like, you know, there wasn't, I mean, it was beautiful, it was different, but it was like, it's yeah. the moon. You know, I mean, it, it, he wasn't. It wasn't like, oh, it was so wonderful, and I had this existential out of body experience because I was hopping on the moon in one sixth gravity, and it was like it's the moon, you know. And, and but it, it, it's to the point that we get to these other worlds. I think in here, so Carl Sagan talked about how the moon is boring. You know, that after Apollo 17, we were bored with the moon. Well, yeah. you make that Mars, <laughs> make that wherever, Alpha Centauri, or the next galaxy. We're going to be bored with, uh, you know, Pluto. We're already sort of bored with Pluto, right? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> we can't I mean in, in a sense, <laughs> that, 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 to Ken's point, that, that no change of place. Um, and he starts the book off by saying, we've been demoted from the center of the universe, right? Mm -hmm. that, 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 that we're, the, the, the cosmographic location of Earth has moved, and now we're less significant. But if we move, we're not going to be any more significant. Mm -hmm. I mean, and I, I talked <coughs> about the significance. I, I had a question I recorded on that very point. Are you going to play that? If not, can I just mention it? Sure, I might have touched on it. Yeah, um, because it struck me that Carl Sagan and um, the anti-Copernicans of the Catholic Church are buying into the same assumption. And it just struck me reading this. It says, and, and he goes into really good detail about how, you know, people thought the Earth was the center of the solar, the center of everything. And then Copernicus came along and said, hey, the Earth goes around the Sun. So the Sun is the center of everything. That was the fallback <laughs> position. Then we figured, well, the sun's not the center either, and then we're not the center of anything. But the reason that uh, the church and everybody fought so hard against that was because of the, you know, why is why is they fight so fight so hard against it? Because their assumption is that our physical position in the universe determines our significance. Okay, that's the kind of the underlying assumption. That's why they fought mm -hmm. so hard against it. Right. So why? I think Sagan and all the anti centrists of everything are, are buying into the same assumption that our significance in the universe depends on our physical location and if we're not the center of the universe then we're not significant that's where they're taking yeah it. and that that's exactly right mike and i do ask her that question in another kind of roundabout way i asked okay. her how did her dad determine our yeah. significance because yeah, see i think i think the assumption is just wrong it is it's yeah. the copernican principle it says yeah. that, that and and really the medievals if you go back to when this this was really embraced it was like the position of earth under the moon it was like a dump it wasn't like oh the, the throne of all you know god loves us because we're a mess in some sense it wasn't it wasn't a wonderful uh you know harmonious sort of picture that but but you're right to the point it's a fallacy to think that well, if I if I live in the geographic center of North America, am I significant? Mm -hmm. If I insignificant, yeah. less significant? If I am off center a little it's bit? It's kind of like both groups argue the argument <laughs> wrong. 
Okay, so yeah. so yeah. the the, the um, you know some of the Christians were saying uh, we've got we've got to be at the center of the universe because that's what makes us important. Well, that was wrong. It doesn't mm -hmm. matter where you are. That's not what creates importance. But then it's like the others will argue. Oh, we found out we're not the center of the universe, so we're just a pale blue mm -hmm. dot mm -hmm. are, and are insignificant. Yeah. Well, you're arguing both sides of the wrong argument. Yeah, mm -hmm. and see, I think this is the thing that people go to immense trouble to say we are not the center. They they spend you know pages yeah, and chapters it's about that. It's a fallacy. That. It's a fallacy. Yeah. So I but think that that's I worry, interesting. I think the right. underlying assumption that we are significant is questionable. I, I think that's you look the, at the size of the, of the yeah. cosmos. Yeah. But that's our question. We're asking: the size right ma does size matter? That's the question. Well, I think that's, <laughs> Ken's so, got it, so. I, so I, you're right in a sense, Mike. I think, but my worry is that that you're finding a way to salvage the importance or the, the significance of humanity. You still want to hold on to that. Well, I'm right? saying we look for significance in a different place than our physical position. I, I, I know that, but I worry yeah. that by doing that, by, by making that argument, you're still not grappling with other aspects, that uh, points that he made that, that, you know, that the whole young earth creationist thing is, a, is an attempt to make us uh, temporally in the center of the universe. In other words, we're not just the tail end of billions and billions of years. We, yeah. We're kind of central to the story of of history and 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 also uh, animal life. You know, we, we tend to think of ourselves as wholly separate from the animal world. We, there's this tendency, a religious tendency, to to invest ourselves with more significance than we really uh, are, are, are are owed to ourselves. Uh, and I think by by focusing on the erroneous logic of Sagan and others, I, I think you're you're failing to really come to terms with the fact that we are insignificant. We, until we realize Speak for yourself. <laughs> Sorry. No, I mean, I mean, the thing is, um, okay, uh, where does our significance lie? And I think from the Christian point of view, and James keeps saying this, we're made in the image of God, and anything else is open for interpretation. And I, I ask, from a non-Christian point of view, we can be totally insignificant. But that's that's going to be the last question of Sasha, too, about what, where, uh, do, we, where do we derive, derive to be the significance from. Okay. But I think both her book, uh, I, I shouldn't say her book, I haven't read it, but certainly the article that she wrote for New York mm. Magazine, and really part of the premise of Pale Blue Dot was about significance. Oh, and, and that whole picture, I mean, that's what makes it so haunting. When Voyager flips around and takes it, and that's that little speck right there, that's that's everything. Everybody, how does he say it? Every everyone who ever lives, everyone you've ever known, all of it. James, I just demand done. to be insignificant. Okay. Well, can you well, give me that? I can make the case for you already. We'll make it. We'll make it. I shouldn't say that about my my esteemed co-founder. But it's interesting though because though I mean in the first in the first part of the book. Um, he's talking about, this is a quote from page nine in mine, our posturings, our self-imagined self, our imagined self-importance, yeah. the delusion, delusion, we are, that we have some privileged position in the universe, are challenged by this pale point of light. Now, it's still very anthropocentric, because you have a small man on a small pale blue dot pronouncing what we are and where we are in the universe. Yeah, who is he? I mean, that's, it's still, it's very significant. He, it's very significant. The <laughs> statement that I am insignificant <laughs> is profoundly significant. Very cool. Oh, and I should believe you why. Very cool. And why <laughs> should I believe somebody <laughs> on a, on a dot? Insignificant, right. Yeah. Why should we believe somebody insignificant? insignificant. Which, which begs the bigger question, why do we, why do we trust anything we think? Right, so here we have the idea that, that, that yeah, anyway, but, and then it's interesting, though, at the last part of that paragraph on page 9, he says, In all of our obscurity, in this vastness, there is no hint that help will come to, from elsewhere to save us from ourselves. And then he just, save us? Why do we need to be saved from ourselves? And from his perspective, what's what's we are what's we're wrong with us? Well, we don't need to be saved. Well, if we're insignificant, why do we need <laughs> salvation? It's okay. We put Chris has an insight on that. Well, that's okay. I mean, he, he answers that question at the end of the book, right, where he talks about all the ways that we have now developed the technology to exterminate ourselves in a variety of the ways. Chinese, I think yeah, you can and do that. and the solution <laughs> to that that he puts forth, you know, is that we cannot. His idea is that we have no sign in his mind. Obviously, people in this room disagree, but there's not going to be a God coming down to clear the atmosphere, knock away the asteroids. Unless it's alien. Now, if we, but if we, <laughs> no, if we seriously, seriously, I left, I left yeah. thinking, I left thinking the only real hope, because even Sasha talks about 
whatever survives is not going to even be human. So the only hope we would have is that something, if, if you take there's no God and, and the vast of the universe, that some, some other civilization out there on some other star has advanced to such a place because they're, they're eons ahead of us that they can actually have got the technology developed to come out and rescue us and and basically the alien becomes our savior. And but then why would they that we're that insignificant? <laughs> you, you forgot AI. Oh, those guys are great. AI. Well, and I, that's not something and it's right we, here. Get to the next. And it's going to happen I, in our lifetime. Is it going to save us or destroy us? Save, what do you mean save? Define exactly. Save. Exactly. And that's the point. If we if save we, us from extinction? Yes. Okay, so so here's What's the thing about uh, here's the thing about oh, nuclear war or a, or a telescope or a nuclear war or something. Let's say we've we annihilate you know most of the population. Is that in a naturalistic perspective, is that a good thing or a bad thing? We're gonna to have to get to this last interview because we have some other that's the, things. Can, so, yeah, that's an oral last question. question. Can, do we need to get your comment? Um, well, I, I just find it profoundly ironic that you know, I was growing up I read books against humanism and that one of the one of the prevailing themes was that humanists are wanting to be the captains of their own ship, make their own significance, and elevating humankind or mankind uh, to the pinnacle of uh, of the universe and, and basically abrogating their position uh, in defiance of God. So that they're, the, the accusation was that we're too, we're, too right. we're elevating ourselves too much. And yet it's, it's people like Sagan who, who are demoting our significance. I'm demoting our significance. I'm realizing the truth that we are not significant cosmically. Whereas it's the religious people that are wanting to say, oh, well, we are the apple of God's eye. Um, that's that's kind of an inversion of the whole accusation that, that humanists are the ones that are the, um, the ones abrogating their. Well, what's the appropriate place of, of 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 man? That's the question we're all asking. Well, I think a sober real a sober uh, correspondence to reality is what we want to. Yeah. We want to strive yeah, and and so the point is 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 from looking at our dot who def who on the dot defines the, what's sober reality about everything. That's the question. Oh well, that's easy if you're on YouTube. You're well, well, yeah. Well, yeah the, <laughs> <laughs> You'll live forever, Jim. Let's do this. <laughs> this is, I think, a great wrap-up interview. And by the way, this is all of this was edited and done. I mean, we came in, uh, Brady and I came in, and George, I think you helped on that too, on, on, on shooting the interview. Were you here for that? What's not sure, no. Yeah, you weren't here for that part, no. I'm sorry. So anyway, but um, he's the one who lined up the interview. It's part of a longer one-hour podcast. It's also on video. I'm going to give you the link to that when this is over. We're only seeing a small portion that was designed just for the book club, the book club questions. So um, I'll give you that link in a minute. But it's a great wrap up for our club tonight because Sasha's gonna address on these last questions. What did her dad think about Jesus? And what, where do we derive our significance? The very thing we're talking about. So uh, let's go ahead and watch that now. any like I don't I guess scientifically and philosophically like those are one thing to me I think and to my dad like his philosophy was science I'm sure like cultural traditions that were Jewish and things that you do to say it's springtime like Passover opposed yeah. to doing you know that's that's one thing but in terms of actual worldview and philosophy um science was the root of that and like you know we're significant to ourselves mm -hmm. as a species right. and we but I think that's a different question you know if we feel like you know love our love for one another is really meaningful and important I think that's beautiful and that's great but I don't think that that means it's like um universal you know it just means that this is what we do on this little planet at this little moment um mm. and maybe that's totally great and wonderful and that's enough for us but I don't, yeah, and I, I mean, for me, I think it is. I don't think it has to be, you know, universal. I don't think that yeah. it has to, it's just, this is what, this is how, in my, um, this is how we've evolved. Um, and it's a, it's a great evolutionary advantage to get along with the other members of your species. And we are, you know, sometimes we're terrible at it and um, sometimes we're really good at it. And, you know, that's how we raise our young and we live in communities and we, that's how we get along and that's how we make 
more of ourselves. Um, and I don't think that that means that it's the singular way to be in the universe. We just don't have any other evidence about how to be on other planets um, or, you know, in out in the multiverse. But um, I think that you know, we're always going to look at at everything through our very narrow lens of being yeah. our particular creatures in our particular place, and that's okay. But I think, like anything, you know, we we should be self aware. It's like if you, I don't know, if you live in a country and you've only ever been in that country and you only speak that language, and the way you see the world is filtered through that lens, you know, that's okay. But just we have to be aware that it's not the same for all the other. Right. I mean, it's a really interesting question. I would have to really delve into some of the historical data, but in terms of somebody, an iconic person who, um, you know, I mean, was like, Really, um, I think by modern standards would be considered a really enlightened hippie. Um, and I really <laughs> admire that. And somebody who really, you know, I think that's a really wonderful thing. And uh -huh. um, somebody who really was interested in treating people equally and um, who, uh, you know, didn't didn't see a lot of the dis distinctions um, between groups that are so central to yes. um, the way we organize ourselves today, sadly. But your dad, in, from the contact quote, your dad, your dad was not a, a mythicist. He did believe in the existence of Jesus, of Nazareth, as a, as a person anyway, correct? I think so. I don't know. I'm going to have to ask my mom. I don't know. I, I think so. We have to, we have to, yeah, well, I, have to, I have to get back to Yeah, I'm, I'm careful. I wrote, a, I wrote a small paper on him uh, about his religious beliefs. I wanted to have a nice, uh, a, a good, concise background of, of that. And I didn't want to pull from the fiction and think that was his statement, but it seemed to be, I wish I had the quote with me. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah, you'll have to let me know what you, what your mom thinks about that. Yeah, and uh, I'll one find more out. Yeah, all right, that'd be great. One more secret squirrel question. Do you know when Cosmos is coming out? I do know, you're, but I'm not saying. You're not supposed to tell. Well, I figured that. I thought I would ask and just throw it out there. <laughs> Came out March 9th. Oh. So what is this? Uh, Sasha's been wonderful. Thank you for sending me a copy of the book. Uh, I sent you a copy of our Cosmos book to New York. I don't know if you got it or not. So I guess yes, I got it. I haven't had it just got home the other day. Okay. So I had a chance, but it's okay. All right. So just tweet me when you, if you have a question or you think it's crazy, just let me know. I will. Thank you so much. All right, Sasha. Nice to meet you. Okay. Take care. Thank you. Way cool. Well done. Yeah, good job. Pretty good second. Today's would be his eighth birthday. Mm -hmm. okay. Wonder and awe of the cosmos. Mm. Um, now, for those who want to hear the whole podcast, his podcast title is Good Heavens. Did I mm -hmm. get it right? Okay. Good <laughs> Heavens with Daniel Ray. And who's the co-host? Uh, Wayne Spencer. You can find it on patreon.com slash good heavens. That's just the audio version if you want an audio version. Um, and I'm on YouTube as well. The video interview, what we saw tonight, is on YouTube, full oh, hour mm -hmm. on YouTube. Um, you have a link on there, right? Well, here's the link. If you'll go to watchman.org slash cosmos, it will jump you straight to the, the video and watch the whole hour. And there was a lot of gold in there, but it didn't relate to the book club. So mm -hmm. it's uh, something that you might want to see. Mm -hmm. So um, she was awesome to talk to. She, she didn't, she, it, it's funny, I forgot who I was talking to half the time. She does not wear her her name like a princess. You know, she's just so down to earth. I'll yeah, talk to anybody. Yeah. We met on Twitter, and I, it's funny how we met because a friend of mine who follows me said you guys should talk to each other. I'm like, she's not going to talk to me. And then I get a tweet from her saying, Yeah, I'll talk to you. What do you want to do? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, Really? Yeah. <laughs> so fortunate in our book club. That We've had Frank Turek, yeah, Richard Carrier here, right here. There's no one we can't reach out to and mm -hmm. not. Probably snagging. Trying to get Nelly T now. Right. All they can do is say no. But that's more. Well, he was too busy. He at least replied. He, he was I'm too busy, busy, but he did reply to us. Yeah, he did reply. Yeah. Sam Harris maybe a little out of range. Yeah. Maybe uh, next Bill year. Craig maybe 
Who knows? You know, no, Bill Craig would do it definitely. I, he's, I, I, I know him. I've got a cell phone. Carroll would be out of the range. <laughs> and that number is. I don't know. Him. I, so? I know who he is. Oh, I, can, I know somebody that knows him that might don't, knock on his door. Uh, you never know. Sean no, Carroll would be the bomb. Yeah. I could, I could, All you do is ask. They'll now, know now Sean up. Carroll was uh, debated Bill Craig at, at the, and we own, well, we distribute that actual uh, video of that. So it was the. Uh, the uh, Greer Herd Forum at the at the uh, New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary. The guy who heads that up is a member of our board of directors at Watchman, uh, Bob Stewart. He's a philosophy professor at the university. And what they do, they finally ended their 10-year run, but they, they had funding to go 10 years, and they tried to have on topics. kind of reminds me of the book a little bit. They tried to get point-counterpoint discussion uh, with the top in that field of whatever it is they're talking about. They're talking about, they have Bart Ehrman discuss it with, uh, who's the guy from Dallas Seminary? Um, Dan Wallace. Dan Wallace. Um, so they had Sean Carroll uh, point counterpoint with uh, Bill Craig on, on cosmology. And uh, we have actually, on our website, we have that whole series. If you're interested, you can get the uh, audio, audio or video. A lot of content like that with uh, Justin Breyer. Yes, yeah, mm -hmm. who, who we had on the and show. And Justin joined us from yeah. London yeah. by Skype and came in and addressed the book club That's as well. That's how I so. found out about this book club. Oh, that was the amazing thing. Oh, that that so shows you the power of the internet. That, that we had three new, no, four new members the very next month who heard about it, who, not from North Texas, they heard from about London. it from London. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy. Mm -hmm. Yes. Very welcome. Uh, are you guys familiar with uh, Dr. James Tour? He's a synthetic uh, organic chemist based out of Rice University in Houston. Well, who isn't? Of course. It, it's, uh, <laughs> no, I, 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 don't, I don't really. I, just, oh, I know who he is. Got, yeah, oh, I've he's seen got him. some pretty he's powerful pretty YouTube. Yeah, yeah. 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 He's, uh, pretty he doesn't famous. have a book yet, though. He no, he only no. writes articles. He doesn't yeah. Yeah. He he doesn't doesn't do one book. And it was smart guy. But Very he's recognized guy. outside of Christian the Christian world. He's recognized as one of the 50 most important scientists in the world mm. across disciplines. Mm. Yeah. He's doing nanotechnology stuff that is mm -hmm. absolutely science yeah. fiction. These, he and other scientists race molecular sized cars against each other. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> okay, question just on, on, the, on our future. Everybody knows what we're doing in December, right? We're going to do the, the <clears> secret <throat> book. Um, are you guys kind of in favor of doing, taking a break from doing a book and doing an hour long uh, documentary and watching that and discussing that. What does that, uh, Ray, um, what's his name? Kurtzweil. Kurtz, Kurtzweil. Uh, Transcendent Man, does that sound like a possibility for? Let's give it a try and evaluate month? it. That's okay. how we'll know. What's it about again? <clears throat> it's it's about a singular transpersonal, singular Transhumanism, transhumanism. Yeah. merging with AI. Yeah, and, and, oh, yeah. and, and the exponential <laughs> growth of technology <laughs> and why that does um, he, he's very optimistic about a type of virtual immortality he being, is, being no, possible. He is. No, it's a little bit of a fringe figure. He's oh, he's definitely fringe. Yeah. yeah. But it's so a, he's interesting. Yeah. You won't be bored watching it. I guarantee no. you that. Let's do it. Okay. Would yeah. anything in transhumanism not be kind of fringy? Exactly. Yeah. 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 That's our future. <laughs> Strap in. No, no that's where we're going to be. Getting back to uh, uh, Carol, we'll see how it comes. his book, The Big Picture, covers every single topic we have ever co covered in this in this discussion that he talks about the, the fine-tuning argument, origin of life, morality, you That's name it. Not so much about Jesus, good. but mm -hmm. you know, okay. everything That's else. That's the book, The Big Picture. Should we read it? Yeah. The, yeah, the, 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 the one on the prop. It's a bit long. Bit long. Uh, it's good. On, it's, uh, it's readable, though. chapters that would uh, highlight. He's, is the, 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 the book, the book on parts of books and doing the next part another time? Huh? We were going to do that Ken's, but, you know. Yeah. Because I mean, so much of the book we says, okay, we can do one chapter or two, but we, we, there's no way we can cover the whole book. So well, I kind of thought about maybe well, doing there, there are members of our book, book club. Yeah, I'm not necessarily one of them, but there are members of our book club that do read the whole book and they're ready to talk about the whole book. Yeah. Every month. But yeah. I, I'm just trying to say there are other members of our book club that um, they would they they're interested in the topics, but they're not readers, you know. And so it's this is why I try to give you a video alternative if you can't uh, read the book, watch this video. Uh, if you you know, or if you want to read, read the whole thing. I encourage that. But here's the four my, most important chapters. I, I just try to give some options. Like yes, that. Good. Yeah, it yeah. is because I did read this whole book. Well, and I, I'm not even going to tell you how how that is like maybe the first or second time <laughs> I've through the whole book. But it's not that I'm not interested. It's that 
It's a time. 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 Yeah. It is. I always listen to yeah. Audible if that's a. If that's oh, a I, did. That's I can't. I, I get. I start daydreaming. I can't. Mm-hmm. I have to. I Audible have to works for me for some topics, but not for others. For my commute. I mean, that's just. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. There it is. If you're doing time. windshield time, Audible is great. When we showed Dawn, this is my well-worn I copy. I read. I read. We did a lot of Audible books. Mm. Yeah. 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 Short it's bigger than the paperback you guys have. Hmm. Yeah, let's but for it. those of us who don't have a let's life, you know, <laughs> man, I really highly recommend <laughs> the reading. <laughs> but yeah, the interview with her was delightful. She was wonderful. Um, I think I echo everyone here in thanking you for yeah. that. Oh, it was yes, fun. indeed. It was very well done. Awesome. Very well done. Thank you. Yeah. Who can I get next? Just ask me, and I'll try to get somebody. Anthony else. Anthony Bosco. That's who we were going to do, but we changed. Uh, really? Does he have a book? Uh, yeah. Uh, well, no, but he does. Uh, uh, Peter Bogosian's no, book. Well, he's, yeah, his uh, disciple. He can read that book and Bogosian's book. To do <laughs> and we can a manual book. for creating yeah. atheists. Anthony would come here, wouldn't he? Because he lives in San Antonio. Doesn't ah, he? he might take a little scratch. Who knows? But yeah, we can get him up here. Is it, is it possible to read the book without becoming an atheist? That's important. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you automatically will. Is he going to do some NC videos he, with us? Yeah. It could be an interactive thing, a uh, street epistemology workshop kind of deal. Jimmy, we'll you, teach you, us you how to do it. All our trade secrets. Because even Christians can use street epistemology. <laughs> It's a method. method. I'd so, like to ask so him what I, the I just want is. to do a quick recognition here too, because we thank Dan for reaching out to Sasha, but but it just seems great to me that here we are, a little group sitting in a little house in Arlington. On a pale blue dot. <laughs> <laughs> and look at the impact we're having, and look at the connections we're making, and that's credit to you, James, and you, Bill. Yes. yes. This yeah. is significant. So, well, <laughs> Not to the Chinese in China, man. <laughs> <laughs> I was at my workplace and having a weekly theory. meeting the other day, and they asked, they had icebreakers, and they said, "Well, what books are you reading?" So they went to know what book we were reading, and I said, "Well, I'm reading Pale Blue, Pale Blue Dot as a part of the Atheist Christian Book Club." So I had to explain what it was, and mm-hmm. we were having Sasha Cohen, Sasha uh, Sagan, Sagan. 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 Uh, why did I say that? But uh, you know, interviewing her, and they said, "Wow, how, how did you get that? How big is your group?" I said, "Well, maybe about thirty people." Oh, how, I mean, that's amazing. You know? And so one thing it is amazing. Yeah. The thing really that is. really uh, said, yeah. I, I originally asked. This is funny. This is a God thing. I'll say it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah. I I originally it was just going to be her me doing a podcast with her for my own podcast. I had no idea we were doing Pale Blue Dot when I made that arrangement with her. Really? Oh, oh wow. wow! I'm not kidding. Yeah. And then I told her about the book club. She's like, Oh yeah, oh yeah, we're doing it. Clearly, but, a thing. but it was yes, uh, it was clearly. pretty. I I called James. I said, Guess who I'm not going to be on my podcast? And he's like, Guess what book we're reading? I'm like, no way. No <laughs> way. Something is strange at the circle. <laughs> uh, change your subject here. Uh, have you heard of uh, uh, Dr. Uh, John Sanford? S A N F O R D. He's a publisher in Genetics. He wrote a book called uh, Genetic Entropy. John Sanford? No, Genetic I Genetic Entropy. Yeah, uh, it's uh, Amazon.com. You can okay. All right. Yeah, in one sense, genetic what's entropy, the entropy the idea of the is that uh, human genome deteriorates with time. It fits with the second law of thermodynamics. Right. So our genetics yeah, are so our human the genome law. deteriorates. Yeah. As I, I think I've seen evidence of that. Every generation, <laughs> uh, aging is nothing more than uh, mutations of our cells. So we yeah. don't mutate into X Men or anything like right. that. Right. We, we, we mutate into mutate old men. To die. <laughs> yeah. Basically, yeah. Oh, that's. And uh, they, go they actually uh, they have some population geneticists actually did study 20 years ago showing that you know they they extrapolate back. To the mm-hmm. past, and then pr- predict the future. So we had AI. So thousands of it, years ago. It, it's about the human genome would totally deteriorate after about nine thousand years. No. So if you think that we uh, exist about six thousand years of uh, civilization, then in three thousand years we would become extinct. As a human species, as we know. Right. Today. So he uh, he uh, he was started out as an evolutionist. Oh. Now he's a Christian. I thought we would wow. die <laughs> based on that evidence. Wow. wow. There's so yeah, it's much called genetic entropy. Well, you can look into it. Yeah, some YouTube. You know, yeah, you, YouTube, uh, oh. John Sanford. Well, we didn't feel bad enough. Thank you. Now yeah. 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 Sorry, yeah. man. That's facts, man. Let's, let's, let's go ahead and wrap up. <laughs> 20 years ago. One final question before we pull the plug. Uh, uh, d- with a show of hands, does anybody want to meet me here at 1 o'clock tomorrow to go to see that? And I'm. Okay. 
Right. Three of us. I can. I got a show. Thank you. Oh, you know. I knew you had a show to do. Yeah. So. yeah. Uh, okay. There's one other option. There's going to be other showings. Is it? Is it like we can we have like, more? Can we have more yeah. participation? Yeah. You you want to delay it? Also, they also have um, Pink Floyd, The Wall, and Dark Side of the Moon every other. Friday. Every hand will go up. Don't so, offer them that. I'm just telling you. <laughs> hey, I, what about? What we about, saw that too. <laughs> what about uh, making this a Saturday thing? Okay, that's another point of discussion, but let's, let's finish up Black Hole first. Would you guys, bet, uh, oh, and by the way, if you want to go a little bit further, they also do it at the planetarium in Fort Worth, the Natural Museum of Science. They do it there as well. Mm -hmm. So, And there's more showings that look like there than there is in And they have an IMAX at the Fort Worth. Well, I don't know they do it there, though. I Not in the IMAX. No, they do it in the astronomy place. Right, the yeah. astronomy place. So. Mm -hmm. But um, so, how, how many of you in favor you might want to do, but if we postpone it till December or January or something? Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, let's do that. We're going to postpone then. Okay, you two can go yeah, still if you want to. Um, and you'll be here. I'll be anyway. here. I might as well. I'm going Which is the better planetarium for the visuals? Uh, a UTA. Really? Mm, it's bigger. I think it's UTA bigger. Is bigger than the Fort Worth one? The Fort Worth one is tiny. The little, yeah, the is little astronomy oh, one well, is tiny. No. I'm telling you, if you're thinking, but the, the, the confusing thing is, is the IMAX, the IMAX is, is a dome. Yep. Their IMAX is a dome, and you think that's the astronomy thing, but it's not. The astronomy it's thing is really tiny. Uh, um, no. But the UTA is better because they do it for technical science things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's cheap. It's cheap. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. let, me, let me ask this as well. We were forced into this because of Sasha's schedule, uh, but Saturday has some benefits to it. One of them, those that come from Plano and Allen and, and along, the traffic Oklahoma. is so much. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's, there's, you know, once you get up to Allen, it's really faster to drive to, to, to Oklahoma City and yeah. fly back down. Wow. That's the fastest way to do it. <laughs> but uh, that's the worst, the worst, the worst traffic in Dallas is going to be Friday yeah. evenings. And Saturday's a lot better. But a lot for a lot of people, that's family day mm -hmm. or this won't work. Uh, how many would would like to maybe shift over to Saturdays? Or 50-50. I could go either way. How many of you would say uh, you'd like you prefer to keep it Friday? That does work better for you. Uh, how many would look at and this, this has a, a negative of it's hard to remember which day it is, but maybe doing some Fridays and some Saturdays. How many? Yeah, yeah. 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 okay with that. Okay. All right, but maybe we alternate it up, and there, we might have people that can only come on Friday and only come on Saturday, but they want to be at least somewhat involved. Okay, so we'll take that into. Would it be the first Saturday of every month again? Like I don't know. Uh, I've noticed that on the holidays, it's it's you you're, you want to stay away from the middle of the month or later for Thanksgiving and Christmas yeah. especially. Oh yeah. Okay. So uh, 4th of I July would be the planning, only one that's hurt by... I just mean by. for planning purposes. If we oh, know it's the, generally January. the first Saturday, then you can kind of make your plans. Mm -hmm. So on an even-numbered month, we do Fridays. And <laughs> 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 if there's going to be much math involved, I'm already He's against it. He's trying to put order, order in the universe. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> well, anyway, I want to say thanks again. Uh, I hope you'll be back in December. Um, I, I really, really look forward to this. This has been a good meeting, um, a real good one, I think. Um, and uh, appreciate. I felt like we got more help than usual with Daniel uh, helping on the interviews and, and, I'm the staff and stuff now. like that. Daniel is on staff. I talked about it. we have an intern from uh, technically from New Orleans Seminary, although he didn't live there, and lives in Dallas. And then Daniel has, has joined our staff uh, right now, a um, staff apologist uh, for the ministry, and is going to be helping us out on quite a few projects, including things like this, this video editing that he did with. And we're going to try to. Turn the uh, do some more apologetics, do some podcasting, um, uh, maybe do some like I was thinking a podcast follow up. How did the Atheist Book Club go this month and put it out there? Maybe a Twitter handle, Twitter Twitter handle for the Atheist Christian Book Club, Twitter handle. I don't know if say that. Uh, but podcasting apologetics uh, interviews and um, catching up to Jim Halls. <laughs> yeah, it won't be hard. <laughs> No, but it's well, fun. I'm glad to be on board. Yeah, well, you guys do put out, you know, as far as having lots of content coming out. Yeah. I know that's not easy. Every other day. I know. I know We've hit a plateau cool. now. Like, subscribe, share. <laughs> We've been hanging right at that 8,000 mark for a couple months now, so we need to get a big name on or something to boost it. Yeah. Oh, come on. Well, a lot of this, you know, you know and we've already done name, some, though. you know, we, we, you know, a lot of my Christian friends don't understand, but, you know, we, we need to be partnered with Atheist Edge and things like that because I don't, you know, we, we, we want to have Atheist 
to interact with. I mean, it's not that it's boring if it's just Christians. To me, it's boring if it's just Christians <laughs> talk about it. You're back in the echo chamber, which is part of what we're trying to get away from. And so, uh, you know, you guys help get it word out. You get people here. You've been our here, most you know, viewed. The club. Our most viewed videos are the ones we have believers on with us. Yeah. If it's just us echo chambering, no, mm -hmm. no one watches it. Yeah. Mm. So, uh, <laughs> and and you'll like Atheist Edge if you've not seen it because he he just like in here, it's a respectful conversation. It's not I got you or ridicule. Except maybe if there's one or two guests that you might have, but for the most part, it's very, very good. <laughs> Can we give their initials? <laughs> you know who you are. No, you're not here. You're not here. But if you're watching on YouTube, you're on the, on the Facebook, you know who you are. Uh, what kind of audience do we have? We didn't have any questions this time. Nothing. No, Facebook no questions. All right. Were we that interesting? What What happens? There were six people questions? watching the whole time, which is about average. But it's, yeah. every once in a while, we we'll get a question or two. But usually, Typically who's your super is, fan? The, uh, the, is she a Messianic Jew? She's oh, not yeah, a Christian yeah, yeah, yeah. or an atheist. She's a former Mormon, now Jewish. Yes. She usually has oh. a question, but she wasn't on. Mm -hmm. And we had, we had John from the Washington, D.C. area who was a regular. I haven't seen him, him with any questions in a while. So, huh. uh, but, but what happens is, once it goes off the live, it posts an hour later or something like that. And typically, we will mm -hmm. have... 1,500 or then it blows up. even sometimes yeah. 3,000 views. Now, some of them are views for 30 seconds. In the, but when you have three or 4,000, some of them watch the whole two, two hours plus. If you want to put the whole hour-long thing on edge, you can do it. I you don't get the metrics on how long people watch that. I'll just go to your yeah, channel. Yeah, actually, you, you can go through the show average watch right. time. Just and no two yes, things. Go back give credits. I always give credit. Yes. Um, oh, okay. The videographer, there's video files that have to be credited to Jason Jean. Is right that in now. your description section? It didn't put it on there. I'll have to put it on the video. Well, you do it. We'll talk about it later. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, well, thanks so much again. We will see you in December. And uh, thanks for being part of the Atheist and Christian Book. Um, you have it on your channel.